Boom! Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2021 of Orlando, Florida. 15-year anniversary being held at 21 Summit Triple Conference Super Conference event experience. Our next speaker is a very good friend of mine. I'd say my best friend at this point in my life. He's someone who's more than a friend, almost like an uncle, and definitely a mentor. Longest running mentor I've had in my life since 2006, back when we didn't even get along. I used to, uh, me and him used to battle on these uh, pickup artist forms and stuff. I thought he was an asshole. The feeling was mutual, but over the many years, we've become very close friends. And uh, he even blames his, uh, the existence of his daughter on me in a very positive way, which uh, is, it, I don't even know how to explain it. It's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big weight in a very positive way. He's someone who's also saved my ass multiple times, including at a huge low point in my life, a world-shattering event back in 2016, uh, bad divorce, found out my wife was a hooker, blah, blah, blah. He took me in when I had nowhere to go. And I really appreciate that and I'll never forget it. So without further ado, please help me welcome back to the 21 Convention stage, a veteran of this stage for over 10 years, Socrates. Welcome back. Thanks, sir. I'm Socrates and everything Anthony said is true. He was the bigger asshole than I was. Uh, and, and in all seriousness, I really do owe him a, a round of thanks uh, because he's provided me an opportunity to learn, grow, share the knowledge that I have with other people, uh, exchange communications back and forth and become a better man in the process. And part of that life arc was becoming a father to my daughter. And it's an existence that probably would not have happened on its own uh, because of where I was at, uh, my fears and culture and some of the concerns that I had. So that is in very no small measure. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm, I'm probably the antithesis of a content creator. Uh, while I do create content, I don't push the stuff out. Uh, I'm not really interested in followers, supporters, likes, everything else, which is really the inverse of what people do for popularity and exposure. But what I do is I try to develop connections with men to make a difference in their lives and follow up on that. And I think there are a number of people who come here that I look forward to seeing again and again. And it's one of the highlights of my year each time I do. So um, I am a professional architect and I'm willing to come up to stand on stages like this and speak about some of the subjects that I do, because I think the nature of what we discuss are not only important, they're critical, and in many ways prosecuted in society today. Uh, there are inherent risks for being uh, seen as an individual who conveys information that's not acceptable within public realms uh, that they may find distasteful. So we do take personal risks in doing that. What I'd like to do, today is discuss not necessarily the stuff I'm normally known for, dating relationships, uh, navigating uh, the sexual marketplace and uh, current cultural events, but really focus in on some elements of today's current cultural events as they will affect you and you in particular. Uh, right now, this is the 21 convention uh, presentation I'm giving. Every individual in this room is a war fighting male. And that is going to be significant in the information we pro provide right now. It's a sincere concern because I prided myself on helping men to have better lives, to have better relationships, to have better marriages or reduce the risks of marriages, to prevent divorce, which ultimately leads a lot of men to suicide. And if I'm looking to save men's lives in a very literal way, the following discussion we will have, I'm hoping will save yours or at least prevent you from doing something seriously stupid and seriously not thought out. And so with that in mind, we'll be discussing the following. As of today, it's late October, 2021. We're nearly two years into a global pandemic. In December of 2019, COVID was first identified. Nearly four months later, that's four months later, the institutions responsible to protect our health and welfare, to give early warning, and to advise governments, finally, finally, were able to identify that this pandemic was truly a pandemic by their own definition, but they were forced to it. Initially, they were playing word games and word salad. Almost a year later, we actually have our first vaccine, experimental in nature. Two others were to follow shortly thereafter within two months. So nearly two years into this, we have three vaccines 
that have cleared supposedly experimental stages of investigation and review that have dubious effects. By the way, you can't really find solid information on their efficacy because they don't stop the, the virus or disease and they don't stop its transmission. There's some concerns here. We were constantly fed a narrative that was life or death. And the images were incredibly frightening. They were serious. And we didn't understand what was going on. The behavioral actions were not, or they were incompatible with what they were, the governments were saying as opposed to what we're seeing. Does this look like the flu? Or a released bioagent? We still can't find out an answer. This is a behavior action. Behavior and what was being said were not congruent. This is the World Health Organization for four, four months. And you think it's just them? The CDC was the same thing. They didn't, they didn't decide it was a pandemic until a day or so later, after the World Health Organization did. Four months for an organization that's supposed to be able to identify and protect world global health, and an idiot could see the writing on the wall. This is where I started having some serious questions. You're seeing something, you're looking at it, and then you're seeing a governmental response. So how are things gonna go? There's a kind of an idiom that passes prologue. And if you can look at it short term, what do you see? I think there's this element of truth and this Confucius wisdom is that the beginning of wisdom is to call something by its proper name. They couldn't even meet a definition of pandemic and call pandemic its proper term. Should I trust this organization? Should I trust this governmental institution? Should I trust the governments in front of me? Or is it gonna be incumbent upon me and my family to sort things out by ourselves? What if we called this pandemic by its proper name? And it's really not the virus, is it? It's the governmental responses to this. That's the biggest issue. Governments initially, and quite honestly, righteously so, were conservative in nature. They contracted, they tried to protect. They were very slow in responding because they wanted to make sure. And there's a human tendency to become authoritarian, to seek higher knowledge and awareness. So we look at these institutions as sources of wisdom. These were the hallmarks and, the, and just the hollow ground of silence, science. These were the science, best scientists we have in our, in our nation and the world. And we look to them and we listen to their advice. The problem is, is that it becomes very authoritarian and totalitarian in the, when they start directing things. So why don't we call things by their proper name? When they overstep, when they overreach, when their authority goes too far. Remember, we're free to do what they tell you. You're free to flatten the curve. This is an interesting concept. This is the first acknowledgement that our institutions were woefully, woefully unprepared. The institutions that were supposed to have stockpile of PPPE were not available. The institutions that should have been able to identify the source of this virus somehow weren't able to pursue their, the, the convictions of science and pursue the matter. So what were they gonna do? Collectively, we were gonna sacrifice some freedoms to be able to slow something down. This is a curve that's unmitigated. And that is gonna be a human tragedy because we know this has happened in history. They've been able to track that. The idea is we would take up strong, strong behavioral actions collectively and mitigate some of that and flatten that out to reduce not only the demand on our hospitals and staff, but reduce the cost of lives, the impacts on lives. Now, the interesting thing is if you just look at it, and well, I'm an architect, I'm not that good of an architect, I'm not that bright of a guy, but I can kind of sense scale because this is just scale, all right, and it's typically one season, all right, and I take my hand, I say it's that large, and if I flip it over, double it, I get this. So if this is three to four months, that's what, six to eight, pretty easy. 
But what did we get? We got an SNL skit. And unfortunately, this isn't the SNL skit. This is actually real life. That is or was U.S. Attorney, uh, not Attorney General, Surgeon General, suggesting we have 15 days to slow the spread. You know what that really translates to? We're going to crash the fucking economy. We're going to per- pull an emergency brake, slam on the fucking brakes, and we're going to slide, skid into this emergency. Again, what does he really know compared to what he's saying, which reflects in what he's doing? Is this a cold? Is this a, is this a flu virus we're, we're responding to? or something far more sinister and menacing to society and the world. What do they really know? All right, and this is, by the way, is somebody who's responsible for national health, U.S. Surgeon General. This is the guy you're supposed to trust. This is a guy who, by the way, I love it, social media, tweeting, come on, man, and I shit you not, that was a quote. Come on, man, with regards to masks. You were not supposed to take care of you or your family by getting superior N95 masks at a time period in which they were supposed to stockpile this equipment and failed. You were supposed to avoid that opportunity to protect you and your family. But you're going to trust them. Remember, you're free. You're a U.S. citizen. Except when it comes to lockdowns, we're going to lock you down. You're going to lose some civil liberties, some freedom for your health. How many businesses had to close? I know we have Eden Smith speaking about it. His business pursued vigorously, legally, because he dared to keep a gym open. Dared to try to feed his family and maintain his standards of living and his livelihood when the nation's locking down. I'm going to ask you a silly question. Was it truly a lockdown? Or was it a tamp down? Because guess what? Big business didn't suffer, did they? They were essential. Some of the best sell season of the year. How many, how many big businesses were able to actually grow massively, maintain operations while small businesses were shut down? I know Amazon's one, Walmart's another. How many others? So we persecute the small guy and allow corporations to run wild. You're free, except for the mass mandates. In all honesty, are we still pretending that a cloth napkin across your face is gonna protect and save lives? And don't Don't take me wrong. I understand fear is real. And I have compassion for people who, in all seriousness, are trying to protect themselves, their loved ones, and doing what they feel is best. But there's no science that sits down and states this prevents viral spread. None. But we're to pretend that it does because men like the Surgeon General say it's true. People that head the National Institute of Health are now reversing decades of scientific review. Center for Disease Control saying the same thing. You're free. Come on. Except when it comes to medical passports. Now, we don't quite have that here yet. But this isn't fiction now, is it? Could you imagine reading a piece of literature, fiction, that would sit down and say, in the continent of Australia, the Australian people would be required to provide case medical history and proof prior to going to buy a fucking cup of coffee? My assessment of the Australian people needs to seriously change. I had the gross imagination that they were rugged, independent, outgoing people in the last kind of frontier continent this world has. 
I had a nostalgic view of these people as better than Americans in some ways because they still live that rugged style, that kind of that down to earth mentality, the straightforwardness. But there's seriously something wrong with all the Commonwealth countries, because we share that in history, that did not win their independence through violence means and rebellion. What the fuck is wrong with Australia, New Zealand, Canada, that this is possible? So let's talk about vaccines real quick. Again, I'm a simple guy, I'm not really bright. Are vaccines effective? If yes, then the vaccine passports are pointless. The vaccine works. You don't need a passport to stop the spread. If they don't work, they don't fucking work. So what's the point of the passport? Does it serve a medical need? Does it fulfill a medical mission? Or something very seriously going awry here? You're free, except for the vaccine mandates. This is where it's getting ugly. It's no longer just a passport. They're gonna mandate it. And this is all for a virus. And if I know this is small, I wanna maintain the, that even at the highest age, 70 plus, 94.6% survival rate for the aged. Next is gonna be obesity, right? Diabetes, all the health markers associated with the diseases of civilization. Unhealthy people are at risk. But we're not gonna talk about that. We're also not gonna talk about, you know, let's talk about children under 20. Three thousandths of a percent. Somebody out there is either a statistician or a uh, role, role playing game individual. I want to actually kind of figure out how many six sided dice would I'd have to roll to come up with, you yeah, end up with COVID and die. How many dice? What, what, are, what are the, how many handfuls of dice do I have to roll and have them all come up number one to actually be of that age? healthy and die from this virus. So this really isn't about managing risk because the risks are incredibly slow. I question why they're doing this. This is gonna happen. It's already happening, it's not fiction. It's already happening. Your children may be forced the point of a gun to get a vaccine you don't want your child to have. What happened to the legal preposition that a parent knows best for what's in the best interest of their children? That's a legal standing. That's being changed. So let's talk about this really quick. What does this really mean for men when you can't protect your family? You, man. Should I honor, respect a man who can't protect his family? Wife, children? Let's take it a step further. It's not just about protection, is it? It's about providing. Your jobs are gonna be at stake and they know it. They're leveraging, that's the coercive element. They're leveraging your employment, your ability to provide for your family, your livelihood, and we all know our sense of identity often is derived by what you do, what we produce, what we create, how you provide for your family. And they're threatening that. And it goes a step further. I've talked previously about the dangers of marriage and the risk factor. What's, what's currently roughly ballpark divorce rate? 50%, 50%. And whether it's higher or lower, I really don't care. So you have one in two chance on a normal basis to have a failed marriage. Does this reduce those risks or amplify them? What's the leading indication other than a woman's sense of unhappiness for cause of divorce? Financial reasons. 
So they know this. They know you intuitively know this. This is just another war on men in marriage. You either submit and comply, or you may lose your family. Now, they'll blame you because it's your marriage, your family, but you didn't follow the mandate. These are choices that you're making, forced upon you, of course. And what do we call when somebody forces themselves upon another person? There's a, there's a term for that. <sighs> kind of rape, isn't it? It's kind of rapish. But they're going to force this on you, but it's for your own good. It's for your own health. You're free to do what we tell you, and it's for your health. COVID, 1984. So let's talk about something real quick. What happens if you say no? I'm not doing it. Not me. No mas. What's going to happen? And I can show you, I know, I'll paint a picture, but let's actually look at reality. Here's a guy in Australia getting fucking mugged by cops. Okay? Now let's really paint this honest picture. This guy, like me, grossly overweight, right? He's a beast. He's literally outside what, in what used to be, what, free Australian air and sunshine, exercising. He's in workout clothes, going for a damn walk to improve his health, which, by the way, should be one of the things he does to protect himself from this virus. Probably one of the most successful things you can do and control, because your age, you can't help. But your fitness state, he's not complying. And personally, I know talking uh, with a couple of guys, I think it's interesting that all the cops are actually masked. I actually think they should be masked the rest of their fucking goddamn lives. It's that goddamn shameful. They should be ashamed of the behavior. They should be wear fucking hoods, not goddamn masks. Amen. But they will fucking put, they will arrest you manhandle you to put a fucking blanket over your face. That doesn't work. Because you went outside and had the audacity to breathe fresh, free air. How about this old girl? You know what her mistake was? She joined a protest. Now, previously on this, this is the one where they bust through the police line. And in all honesty, the police officers got manhandled pretty goddamn bad. What happened though? They went past her, she's in the midst, these boys are so riled up, and she's standing there, turns, and had the audacity to say no to an agent of the government. What did they do? Did they knock her on her ass? No, they really didn't. They hit this bitch so goddamn hard, she fell on her back. Cleanly. Head strikes the ground. And then these fuckers have the audacity to mace her. Both of them. 74-year-old woman. And if that's not enough, that's a steel baton. He's ready to break bones because she had enough. This isn't fiction. This is in what used to be one of the freest countries in the world. First-rate nation. What happened, Australia? Here's another sad case. What happens when a man puts his hands around a woman's neck? Is that assault or attempted murder? Men have been prosecuted for attempted murder for doing it because it's a lethal hold. So what do we have here? We have a young lady not complying and being argumentative. What does this agent of the government do? Puts her in a chokehold. And he really doesn't just do that if you actually look at the imagery. If you kind of look, She's considerably shorter than he is. Here's a shoulder line here. I mean, she is up until the point he picks her up off the ground and slams her head against the concrete wall, the brick wall. As a legal citizen, could you stop that? Is this a police officer under control? But you're supposed to restrain yourself when a law enforcement agent who's trained isn't able to stop that. At what point do you sit down and say, hey, He's a material threat to her life. In the state of Florida, I have the right 
to physically defend another person with lethal force if I believe in all sincerity that it would, that's what's taking place. Could I do that here? I could, but unfortunately what's not being shown right now is right just out of screen view is his partner, a female, and she would have a right to shoot in return, wouldn't she? Because I'm shooting a police officer. So the question is, is are they showing restraint? And the answer is no. We can't expect that, and we won't, as this continues. This is bad shit. This is worse. What you're seeing here is a father, and draped around his neck, hanging off the ground, literally, is this child. This is what forced, forced vaccinations are. This is an actual live event recorded in video. It's poor quality, but I'm glad we have it. We have armed officers going to physically separate the father from the child, and we have nurses just to the left that are going to inject a vaccine that the parent does not want, the child does not want, without their consent. And it goes about as good as you think it goes. If dad goes down, that's an issue. Child is literally running and screaming, screaming, no, 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 no. It's heartbreaking. What do we call when we force ourselves upon somebody and inject something into them? Rape. Rape. Not just rape. Medical rape. And these are people that are sworn an oath to protect our lives, to serve and protect, and to do no harm. By the way, these ladies had no compunction in doing just that. And they did. They went from being heroes of the pandemic to being the villains of a state overreach. How funny are their TikTok dancing videos now? So the question is, as a father, as a man, and particularly you young men, what are you willing to do? What would you do in these people's place? Where is that line that the overreach sits down and says, no, no more. You're not doing this. The fuck you will. Moral justification for violence. Moral justification for armed goddamn rebellion. To take up arms against the state. We have a culture for this shit, right? We have a Second Amendment. We're founded on it. We take pride in it. We celebrate it every year. What do we fight that war for? Taxes? Taxes. This is more than just loss of liberty or a temporary one, because we know it's not going to be temporary. Never is. I think the compulsion to act and respond in kind and violently is completely natural. I also think it's terribly misguided. I think it's a terrible compulsion to have right now to act on it. And my concern right now with you gentlemen is your culture to sacrifice yourself to be the bulwark of our society, of our culture, war fighting males. And I don't want you getting sucked into something and not being prepared to understand exactly what it is. We've already seen one round of this. A protest gone bad. People lose themselves one way or another. And her name was Ashley Babbitt. She paid a very steep price for something she believed in and acted foolishly and got killed for it. So I'm going to propose something. That there's this massive chasm between being impotent to make change, to being subject to this, and the threshold for violence. 
And so let's look at this objectively. Let's look at this through the eyes of history and let's see where the facts fall. Is violence really the most effective form of public protest and response and rebellion? Is violence really effective and efficient? So let's talk about civil resistance, civil disobedience, and civil violence. Let's start with some basic definitions. Let's talk about power. What is the source of power, particularly governmental power? Does power truly flow from the barrel of a gun? Mao believes so. Some great propaganda. Not only do they know the value of the power and the value of violence, but they're celebrating that collectively, unifying people, different nations, different races, together under the banner of communism and socialism. And they're projecting that forward. You sense that sense of power. The Russians believe the same thing, don't they? The Soviets? Does power truly flow from a barrel of a gun? How about this one? Does power come from a deity? Does God ordain it? Does God sit down and say, this man's DNA holds power and has the ability to be transcended through his genetic line? Is that the source of real power? For hundreds and thousands of years, humans believe so. You don't build pyramids in the desert for nothing. Okay? You have to show this. I mean, this is magnificent. Why? Because it needs to showcase that divinity power, wealth, command, Sorry, more propaganda. Is power static? Or can power move from one entity to another? Does power have to be constituted regularly by those that have it? Governments don't want you to think it is. This man and his family paid a cost for that. I think the uh, Kaiser in the center wished uh, power is a little more static than it is. So we know that's not true. What is really the source of power, particularly for governments? It's the will of the governed, the consent of the governed. You, all of you, collectively. Our forefathers knew that. and we started with it. That's a part of American history we need to remember. What we also need to remember, interestingly enough, is that there was 15 to 16 years of civil resistance prior to Lexington and Concord, prior to a single shot being rung out. 15 to 16 years of active civil protest and disobedience opportunity to reduce the casualties of life and to maintain the social civility. Civil resistance, it operates on appeals to the adversary, utilizing pressure and coercion. Civil resistance is not passive. It is an active confrontational strategy to affect power, to express personal power. It is an act of confrontation done civilly. Key here is if you don't have the skills at hand when you need them to behave accordingly or to respond to conflict accordingly, what happens? What happens in the dating world when the girl you're dating doesn't have the skill sets or relationship skills to maintain the relationship, let alone go through and communicate the needs and desires and objectives of a relationship and to be able to resolve issues appropriately. How do they do it? How does crazy resolve problems? They don't, they create them. The issue here is the skill set you have are the ones you're gonna go into this conflict with. And I want you to have better skill sets than crazy. 
The other thing that civil resistance does, it actively tries to destabilize the pillars of the support of the regime above. And the idea is that if you are able to pull the pillars of the support out, it weakens and you can change and shift political dynamics. This man knew that. He came from a third world nation and he fought off a global power to win their independence. This is Gandhi in India I speak of. This man knew it. He made peaceful, nonviolent campaign central to the civil rights movement. That's also American history. It's also terribly successful. So successful, communist countries adopted it. People have won their independence, overthrowing oppressive, tyrannical regimes, violent regimes, using civil rights methods and using nonviolent campaigns for civil resistance. By the way, the trend is that this is now the expectation for those people that are looking for freedom and democracy. This is a choice, this is a pattern of behavior, and it's accelerating. Let's talk about civil disobedience. This is the active refusal to obey a law or an authority based on moral grounds. Right? And it utilizes a number of pressure points on society. And essentially what they're trying to do, it's, it's actively in plan, is that you intentionally violate and disobey an authority with the intent to have an action dilemma, to force their hand in an awkward position, that they either act on and enforce the law and regulation, which then makes them look absurd, or not respond to it and acknowledge that it's trivial or immoral. So it's planned. The other component to this is each movement has a little bit different understanding and acceptance of what that means. And so there'll be issues with <sighs> violating the law is not enough. Like I just can't speed and break a 55 mile an hour speed limit and say I'm doing civil disobedience. You have to be willing to be caught and prosecuted for it intentionally, all right? The question then though is also do you passively or aggressively resist arrest? Do you assist in the booking process? You know, do you comply? You know, are you civil about it? Or do you continue to protest and resist? And the last one, interestingly enough, is how do you plead? Innocent or guilty, right? You know, and so these are some of the factors that each movement has to think about in advance. But the bottom line is civil disobedience is when you actively engage in violating a law and you feel you have a right to do this because it's immoral or unjust, or you're doing it intentionally to call attention to it. But you have to be willing to face the consequences because that's a moral and ethical thing to do. So let's talk about an example of this. How about the summer of love? Remember that? Uh, BLM, riots, fires. Why was this civil disobedience rather than civil violence? Why do liberals feel like they can do this and be morally justified? Most men are weak and beta. How do you get past this? How do you be a real man? How do you be a husband and a father? That has been where we've dropped the ball as men is because we're too accepting. We're too tolerant. I'm calling for intolerance for evil. We need to be able to properly identify with the definition, what is masculinity? We need men to stand up and do heroic things. Building a, a tribe of people who are of like mind, who you can depend on, who will hold you accountable, who will call you on your BS. I call the official tagline for now with 21 Connection is America's last stand for masculinity. Mm -hmm. I think it is. The event, and it's as a reflection of the manosphere, really. You come out and you consciously attend and start talking with these people because people who are coming here are coming here to discuss big ideas, important ideas. We're not just talking about being masculine, but okay, you've done all this self-development, what are you going to do with it? And the answer is our understanding of a definition of what disobedience means. It's not violence when it's done to property. 
when you destroy things that can be replaced. It's not immoral. But the problem is, is the other side of you is that is you're destroying my livelihood, my place of business, my house, my home, my car, whatever it is. So there's issues with that. Liberals will also tell you, quite honestly, that a riot is the voice of the unheard. These people have no other means to call attention to their plight, no other means to protest, to be heard. Kind of makes sense, I guess. I kind of get it. You're angry, can't be heard. You're wailing and lashing out. We should probably have some compassion and empathy for that, right? What was this? Was this really an insurrection? Kind of feels honestly more like an Instagram insurrection, the selfie insurrection. Why wasn't this a cry of the unheard? What was being protested here? Dubious, highly contested election that wasn't transparent? Wasn't that what that rally was about? Wasn't that what that march on the Capitol was about? Where's this individual now and all his compatriots? How many of those have been booked are still sitting in jail 10 months later in comparison to people who burned down Kenosha, who burned down businesses in Minnesota? Why were they booked and almost immediately released. What's going on here? Pay attention to it. Just because the law says something and there's a definition for it, do not think they won't take in consideration who you are. This is a great example of it. This is reality, right? So I think this is a serious issue. I think there was some really shitty things done. I think there was uh, some really douchebaggery behavior taking place. But I get the justification, the instance of it. So let's talk about this. Anybody know what this is? Georgia, Georgia 2003. What is it? It's a mass gathering of people. Happens to be a protest, interestingly enough. Protest that was spontaneous, that lasted, that continued. And what were they protesting? Strangely enough, a highly contested election that was dubious nature, dubious accounting and vote counting, and by the way, that had almost zero uh, transparency. Really similar situation. You know who remembers this? You know who really remembers this? Nancy Pelosi. You know that saying, there's nothing worse than a woman scorned? Who farted in her seat and put their feet on her chair, up on the desk? You think she forgot about that? Dared to violate her office. Dared to walk through it unannounced. You know, force themselves into her office. She felt violated. She references rape, but doesn't say the word. It's interesting because eight or nine months earlier, Democrats said the same thing with AOC, but that wasn't quite the same thing. But what is this a display of? What ended up happening? We have U.S. troops being deployed while in Washington, D.C. This is a display of absolute force. You know who believes violence and power are synonymous? You know who believes power really truly does flow from a barrel of a gun? An administration that was in question, that was tenuous, that wanted that power desperately. What do you think they're going to do when it's serious, when it's a real insurrection? Think they're going to react like that? Or are we going to see a little bit more of a reaction? Let's put this in comparison really quick. How many troops were sent to Washington, D.C.? I don't mean law enforcement officers. I mean truly armed troops, right? 26,000. That's a shitload. Small army. 
How many troops did we have when we were through from Afghanistan? 2,500. So when we compare things and we want to know where values place, we look at behavioral actions. Let's do a comparison. We're withdrawing from the current major operational center for the global war on terrorism. We're withdrawing. We send and provide 2,500 troops. And for an NC selfie gram insurrection with some douchebaggery taking place, we send 26,000 troops. You know what I see when I see this? I don't see security. I see an administration that is deathly, deathly fragile. And they know it. They felt they had to be compelled to do this. You know why? If they were a secure administration, would you have had a single gate up? Because remember, by 6 o'clock or so, that Capitol building was cleared out. Why wasn't the Capitol open for business and people immediately following thereafter? Would that have sent a very different message, particularly in light with what happened? They're sending a different message because they have a different viewpoint. They have different concerns. You don't want to talk about that one because, you know, real elections have curves. So what did this buffoonery showcase us about the current administration and willful use of force. What can we expect in the future? What can you expect in the future if you resist this? More or less of that. Let's talk violence really quick. It's exactly what you think it is. Physical altercation, assault, and in rebellion, a willingness to kill. I'm an architect. It means I build things. I have visions for the future, future creations. I honestly don't understand human beings that fantasize about destruction. And as an architect who stands on this stage for over a decade trying to create a better world, I have concerns about people who are eager for this. I have reservations about the ease in which we talk about this because I think it's terribly destructive. We don't build civil societies through violence. So let's compare these two. Let's just talk efficiency. I think it's, we can talk about morally, but you know, the reality is, is that I think we need to observe it. So interestingly enough, there's been a whole group of people, and this is an area of research, that studied violence. They studied nonviolent campaigns and they analyzed the two. Over 120 years, of every rebellion and resistance movement that they could catalog, analyze the stuff, and they came up with some fascinating results. Is violence really more effective than nonviolent campaigns for overturning governments? This is a complete governmental transformation, nonviolently, that were oppressive and violent and tyrannical, meaning they were willing to kill. The governments were willing to kill their own citizens to stay in power. What do you think the success ratio is? 22%, or yeah, 22%. That's almost a one in four chance. Pretty high. Not great, but one in four. By the way, the people who are professionals at this, the real pros who believe in the violence, whose job it is to enact this violence, whose profession literally is the enactment of violence, have really started to refine this. You would expect them to become better at this. It'll be kind of interesting to see how this plays out. But if you're really kind of interested, the people you'd really want to talk to is U.S. Special Operations Command, particularly their Joint Special Operations Command. Aren't those the door kickers? What are they talking about violence? Interestingly enough, how are they countering it in some of their doctrines to protect allied nations against similar type things being overthrown from other governments. What are the suggestions? Interestingly enough, one of the hallmarks of it is to harden your population, to nationalize that population. Funny how we can't do that in our own country. So, any guess on the success rate for nonviolence? 
45. 45%. I mean, we're almost at 50, right? This is a crapshoot, 50-50 shot. Your average nonviolent campaign has the ability to overthrow a oppressive regime, 50-50 shot. Think you could approve those odds if you're smart about it? Organized, prepared, educated, united, and we're able to communicate that message? You think you could improve that? If I'm really interested in changing this world, do you take the hard path or do you take the one that's more gonna be more likely to bear fruit, more likely to bear success? And if so, where do I place my energy? Where do I place my efforts? It's not as rewarding as an emotional reaction, but uh, Jesse Lee Peterson sat down and told you today an emotional reaction was bitch behavior, didn't he? Anybody want to be a bitch? Feels good. God, the power of a weapon, being able to fire that shit off. I know it. I was in the Army for a little while. There is a sense that power does come from a device that can take a life. You could defend yourself in a manner you physically probably couldn't do before. I think it's terribly human nature too, by the way. I've spoken on this stage before that I believe that human evolution and the human mankind, we're not just killer apes, we're murderous apes. Our brains, everything else, how we develop, kind of points to violence. We have history for violence. We're cultured for violence. But we're evolving. We're learning. I want you guys to do the same. If you're gonna get involved in civil resistance one way or another, I want you to be smart with where you spend your life. Two to one risk success ratio. What do we call that in business when you dominate a field? You call that a monopoly. Start thinking in these terms. You know, if you have a hard time believing nonviolence is kind of an effective way, why wouldn't you want to exercise a monopoly on success? So let's talk honestly about why is violence so unsuccessful in their approach in overturning repressive regimes when you think it would be so successful? And the reality is that violence begets more violence. Regimes who are already oppressive become even more oppressive. Do you think the next time if there was real, I mean, if they set fire to the Capitol, how many troops would we have had? Let's be honest, they're already asking for the global war on terrorism brought home, a domestic surveillance program, the type that we had in the Middle East. We've already had a Facebook post here, which was an image advertising this event, be flagged on Facebook because of COVID misinformation that had nothing but an image that had nothing to do with COVID. But you know what was in that image? The wrong person's face and an algorithm picked up on facial recognition pattern and identified that as a troublesome individual. And that post was flagged. This is today, this is happening right now. We also know violence spreads. Violence is not contained to the belligerents. It goes into other parties that are allied or supporting of it. What do we know about sectarian violence? When you allow a pattern of language to exist between two civil people that includes violence, everybody will resort to it. The other is collateral damage. It's not just belligerents involved. You have civilian casualties as well now. And that accelerates. So let's talk about that really quick. The largest war we've ever fought was the Civil War. 1.5 million people were killed. Now, most of those were combatants. But let's put that in contrast to, I don't know, an armed rebellion. Let's say, let's pick a good one. Let's go to the Russian Revolution. How many people were killed 
in pursuing the grand vision of a politically dominated socialist communist party. Any idea? Historians will tell you it's upward over 60 million people. 60 million people for a political ideology. Those weren't belligerents. To put that in comparison, I believe the total death count for World War II is 57 million. How about the Chinese? How about the Chinese Revolution? 80 million people. So let's just take a really dirty shorthand analogy. Let's just say that the idea of this pandemic and closure falls truly upon political lines. I don't believe that's true. I know it's not true, but let's just theoretically use MSNBC's version of events that this is really a Democrat versus Republican issue. And the belligerents are only the voting parties. How many Biden voters were there? 81 million, if you believe the stats. What I'm telling you is, should we go violent and hold a civil war today in the United States? If I look at history as prologue and look from the past, what can I expect projected forward? I think we'll exceed 80 million. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to be responsible for abetting that world, enabling that to occur. I hope you guys don't either. I'm always amazed at the wisdom of uh, Shakespeare. And when we talk about civility, you know, it's where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. You lose the moral authority when you use violence, don't you? When you physically have to violate somebody to force your will upon them. This is one of the reasons why they're not successful. You lose that standing. You also lose allies and support network. Those groups that would normally support you that are looking at it like, yeah, we're not down with the violence. And we also know most people don't have an inclination to kill. And that has been, interestingly enough, a problem for most militaries to the extent that they actually research it, to the extent that they actually have to train and develop systems to reduce people's inclination to kill. Interestingly enough, one of the best ways to do that, dehumanize your opposition, right? Do we really want to do that when we're trying to create a civil society? Dehumanize your opposition. It also reduces your recruitment pool meaning you have far fewer people. So let's go through these really quick. Uh, one of the biggest ones is sex. When you exclude females, because most females are not going to be inclined to violence, I know that there's a feminism, thank God for feminism for this, right? We have a, a much larger fighting force now. But on the whole, we could sit down and say we lose half our population just based on gender roles. Another one's going to be age, fitness, and commitment. That's me, right? Too old, out of shape. Interestingly enough, I got a day job that I like to keep. You know, I'm not going to be able to commit to the time period in which to be a proper rebellion and, and serve in a military capacity, right? Because essentially what you're doing here is building a military, right? Which then goes to costs. You're going to have to fund that, even if you do it privately. What's a decent M, uh, M, uh, what, AR-15? What's a decent one cost these days? And of course, you're going to go tacky cool with it, right? You got to get the sights, you got to get the thermals, the laser pointer, you know, all the all the all the kit. It's costly. You're going to have to fund that. We also know it takes skill. That's the other component. Just can't give somebody a tool. You have to train to be effective. If you're going to be an insurgent in a rebellion. How much skill are you going to have to have? And by the way, do you really want a straight infantry force? Because everybody thinks they're going to be in the line fighting, right? No support network, right? None of that. No water and beans, no food. There are also operational realities. So you're living in a country. You're going to violate the law. You're willing to commit murder. Are you able to do that publicly? Or are you going to have to do it clandestinely? Can you tell your family? 
friends, girlfriend, others? How do you screen and vet? Those are some of the operational realities. So it's going to be even harder and a bigger challenge than a military force. And let's talk life post-conflict. You only have one in four chance of success. What happens when you're at the other two-thirds? Or th I'm sorry, three-fourths. What happens when you're on the wrong side of that? What's your life going to be like? On the run? Ever be normal again? I think there's something interesting as well, that when you analyze violent revolution, in the last 10 years, anywhere there has been a civil war, there's been a previous civil war in the previous 30. And what that means, again, in very simplistic terms, is violence begets violence. That most rebellions, in this particular case, 90% of the time, current, current assessment, that your successful rebellion will ultimately lead to another civil war within 30 years. Because guess what? You taught your opposition violence is a morally acceptable means to affect social change. What do we know about those nations right now suffering sectarian violence? Anywhere you want to live? So let's do support in comparison of population. As expected, it's a pretty low number for violence because obviously the demands to get fighting individuals prepared and equipped to actually lead a rebellion, resistance movement, is going to be low. You should expect higher numbers for nonviolent campaigns. It's 1.6% of the population on average. All right, That's a 4 to 1 ratio. Not a big surprise here, but why does this matter? What if I told you no campaign has been unsuccessful, meaning 100% of the rebellions that took place, either violent or nonviolent, succeeded when they had 10% of the population mobilized at any one time? Now, this 10% is underscoring people who are actively engaged, who actually came in March, who actually were involved. It underscores the fact that there's a much larger broad a population swath that is supporting them. But that's an incredibly low number. 10% and you've got 100% chance of, of overturning a, a government. Not affecting change in your society, but overturning a government that is violent and oppressive. 10% of the population. And you have 100% of the possibility. You know the problem with stats? It's the outliers that skew it. You know what the real number of people are looking at that study this? 3.5. 3.5% of the population, 80% of the time, they've been successful. Let me go back one. 1. 1.6 is the average nonviolent campaign. 3.5 is your goal. You're almost halfway there just by choosing this method, being organized, and replicating what's already been done. This is how you be successful. This is how you make it efficient. So let's talk about this guy really quick. I'm going to read the quote. This is uh, Frederick Douglass, and it essentially says this, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be opposed upon them, and these will continue until they are resisted, either with words or by blows or by both or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. The limits of tyrants are limited by the endurance of those they oppress. Regimes are fragile more fragile than they want you to believe, and they require institutional support. This is the current methodology of civil resistance. That essentially, a regime is the upper tier of this structure here, the upper group. And these are the support networks, institutional groups. 
All right. And the idea is if you cut that out from underneath them or essentially pull essential members out from that column base into your camp, it weakens the stability of the regime. This is a well accepted and proven model. This is roughly the development since the 1960s that has been formulated. It has been tried and proven in hostile areas of the world. It's been proven successful. The problem though, is it takes time because you have to convince people here, persuade them to change their minds. Now, most people think you're gonna be able to change their minds through a moral argument. Hey, this, this is right, this is the correct things to do, or can't you understand our side? And the reality is civil resistance doesn't work this way. It's not effective that way. Because remember, it's confrontational in nature. And the use of coercion is not only authorized, it's expected. You have to force dilemma on people to recalculate their support. So it's not about the rationality of your beliefs. It's about having these folks recalculate. And if it's a business issue, recalculate their business interests to make it, I don't know, unprofitable, unpopular, unsavory. They don't want to be associated with this. That's how you do that. So let's talk about that really quick. So what do we talk about here? How about members of the media? That's a pillar of support, one of the most critical. The propaganda arm of the government in charge or the regime in charge. What would it take to change this buffoon's mind? You're not. You're not. Because he's a mouthpiece. His existence depended upon telling those lies and willingness to tell those lies, to willingness to spread that information. You're probably not. But you should probably find the individuals who are. True journalists, if they're out there. How about this guy, bureaucrat? And in this particular case, a medical bureaucrat. Or let me rephrase this, the medical bureaucrat. You're gonna change his mind? A man most likely suffering from, what is it, Manchhausen syndrome by proxy? Probably national Manchhausen problem by proxy. I mean, is he going to change his mind? Probably not. Maybe it might be interested in if you don't. I, I would formulate this. What if you were to take this troll and pin him? against the administration so that, that that government is aligned with this man. Change the equation much? How about this guy? Financial economic elites. I think this one's a kind of an easy one. It's not that you need to change his mind. What if he actually said, no, nah, this one's yours. We're going to make sure it's yours. I mean, after all, this is a man who associated with a known sex trafficker because he was recruiting money, just had dinners, you know, downplaying uh, his association, repeated association. I found the interview that they had with him recently uh, fairly enlightening. What did he say about the man's death? What, what, was, what, was, what was the lessons learned about Epstein? He's dead now. Interesting. The lessons he learned is the man's dead now. Does that strike you as odd? Because we all know he killed himself, right? And a man who kills himself just didn't die. You would kind of refer to that. Unless he didn't. I think the... Uh, the meme and the joke is Epstein didn't kill himself. Another bill got to him first, right? A Clinton. I don't know. Maybe we have a contender here that the wrong bill got him or another bill got him. But I don't think we're going to change his mind. I think he's all in. So let's have them have it. Let's let them have a hive of villainy and showcase and publicize that. Not only for what he's done, but for who he supports 
Because, by the way, they're going to do the same thing to you, right? What are the risks for you coming to a place like this? How about this guy? Head of the FBI. Head of the premier investigative unit of the world. There's a saying in Washington, D.C. when I was there that the, that the building knows, the core of a building knows what the top floor wants. Top floor never has to tell the building what they want to hear. The building knows, intuitively know. What position is this man in, really? He's the top of an investigation bureau, no doubt. Does he answer to somebody? Did he get that job by saying no? by speaking truth to power. I might ask a couple other questions too. This is a kind of a meme. This is a Colonel Landa searching for Jews. And the quote during the movie is that you're hiding Jews under the floorboard, aren't you? But I don't know, maybe the head of the, the FBI will be in a position to sit down and say, you're hiding Dr. Seuss books under the floorboards now, aren't you? We laugh, but that happened, didn't it? Elements of racism found in Dr. Seuss's books. Get them while you can. How about these guys? How about your average FBI agent? What do you tell him? What would you tell an FBI agent that you knew and try to pull them out from supporting regime? What would you tell them? Is this why you went into the service? Is this why you became one of the world's premier investigative units? Are you turning into him? Or are you going to be a butt of a joke? Because honestly, can the FBI actually solve a crime they are not complicit in? I got a quick joke for you. How many FBI informers does it take to kidnap Governor Whitner? Three out of the nine at least, right? Here's an interesting one. What do you tell these guys? What do you tell your local law enforcement officer who has a duty to uphold the law? What do you, what do you tell him? What do you tell the good officer standing in the back? Do you tell them, fuck you, asshole, asswipe? Do you do that? Is that effective? Is it true? Or is he in a position like you, having a job, a livelihood, an identity, and interestingly enough, lives in your community, is one of you? What would you tell this individual? How about taking a step back and realizing the same people who are currently saying and pledging to defund the police, them, are the same fuckers that were willing to offshore American jobs and tell you to learn to code. Is there common ground there? Can you work with that? I told the ladies over at 22Con, similar type image, and asked them what could they do? What's the most important, powerful thing you could hear as a husband in a situation like this, that your livelihood is under threat? Remember we talked about the vaccine, mandated vaccine, the threat under men, divorce, losing your family, suicide rates. They're going to face the same thing, right? What could she say that could change that equation? Honey, if you're ever put in this position, we could find another way. Would that change things? Provide an opportunity? We'll see. How about these guys, Department of Justice? What do you, what do you tell the attorneys, the prosecutors, the guys that are going to come after you? I don't know. How about this one? How about, how about another meme? How about imagining, in very likelihood, a very real life, Colonel Landa, in the form of a Department of Justice investigator, sitting down across from you, 
in regards to your actions with your child's school and asking. You oppose pornography in your child's school, don't you? Is this a joke? Or did I just mishear the Department of Justice state they're going to investigate Americans at school board meetings that could become a little impassioned in regards to pornography, child grooming, pedophilia material in their schools. Did the U.S. Department of Justice really say that? We're going to advise school boards regarding this? We live in a digital age, digital social media age. And you know what the power of a one tweet can do? One tweet from this woman with over a million followers made a mockery of a vaccine mandate. Oops, wrong slide, sorry, that one. What if we had institutions willing to support and defend you? and advocated that were well-prepared, well-organized, disciplined in their messaging, and willing to project that over years? What if we had trade unions that were able to leverage their effectiveness to affect change? What happened here? This is already done. Vaccine mandate pressured by politics to the CEO changed a mandate for employees getting vaccinated within a couple of weeks. We're not on as tenuous grounds as we'd think. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those they oppress. If we learn to say no, collectively, we can change this. Instead of trying to topple a regime from outside the system by going to the pillars of support, which we know historically takes time, planning, organization, and you have to sustain that effort. I'm an architect. What can I tell you about foundations? What if you mobilize mass support, mass support, to undermine the foundations of the entire thing. Do you have to go after the pillars? Do you have to have organizations and structures looking long-term at the costs? Or can you do this more effectively, more decisively, electronically and efficiently in today's age? What's the number we're looking for? 3.5. 3.5, and you can change the world. From an oppressive regime, a regime willing to commit violence I don't think you need 3.5. The consent of the governed. That's what this nation was built upon. I want you to remember this history. And yes, we have a history and a culture for rebellion. We also have a massive history, and I suggest we look at it again, review that 16 year history that led up to the armed rebellion. We have a history of civil disobedience. We have a history of civil resistance that is highly effective, proven effective. In times that were not as good as these, when technology and skills and capability and knowledge was not as plentiful as they are today. This is Plato. Uh, and his great quote, at least in regards to this, is the price good men pay for indifference to public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. Civil resistance is an active confrontational strategy to affect personal change and project personal power. It is the antidote to frustration, anger, the gross missteps of the governed and of culture. It also fills an active void 
between impotency and the threshold of violence. Please choose wisely. Thank you. This is Will Spencer from the Renaissance of Men here with the New 21 Report and Socrates. Hey, thank you. Good to see you, man. So, you've been at the 21 Convention since the very beginning, and this is year number 15. Uh, you know, honestly, I've been around since the beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that I missed the first three, to mm -hmm. be really honest. Uh, but this is, I want to say, the 11th or 12th year. Wow. Uh, the 21st time I've been up on the stage. It's kind of wow. one of those crazy. And um, you, you sit down and you go, there's this, I, I used to say there was this nervousness, you know, about getting on stage that large sure. and kind of, you know, the cameras and everything else. And uh, it's kind of alternative to what I normally do in my life. And, but, you know, the reality is it's not so much nervousness as excitement, mm -hmm. you know, the anticipation and desire to perform well. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's always exciting, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's your first time or, you know, in this particular case, the 21st time. So when you get to number 25, do you get a gold watch? Or I, I, at this point, I'm just surprised they keep asking me back, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing because each convention is different. Each yeah. convention has its own identity. Uh, there's different ideas conveyed. Uh, your, your, your sense of time and culture is a little bit different and shape shifted. Mm -hmm. And the environment in which we're talking in uh, evolves and changes as well. Mm -hmm. And so to have been... At that time period now, I sit down and I look forward to the next one because I know it's going to be an evolution of where we were. Mm -hmm. And I always look forward to seeing those modifications and changes and progressions. So, If it's not too big of a question, how has 21 changed in the past 10, 11 years, at least since you've been coming? Uh, it, uh, dramatically, highly, highly dramatically. You know, initially it was, it was a bunch of very young men bootstrapping, mm -hmm. uh, terribly underfathered. You know, mm -hmm. and they were doing a very vigorous and noble endeavor of trying to fill a void in their lives and take on that measure of agency. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is they had the worst instructors in the world themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that's true of anybody trying to teach them some stuff. And so there was this reaching out. And so that there was a kind of a, an, an emphasis on where they were felt most vulnerable, engagement with women, uh, masculinity, those sort of things. And unfortunately at the time period, uh, there wasn't a lot of really good, solid information around that that was reaching them. It's not that sure. it wasn't available. They may not have been know, it, known to them. And, and you have to deal with the world that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't know something that exists outside of it, you're not going to be you know, going towards that source. Right. So as it's evolved, I think there's been other speakers, other content, other ideas that have spread that awareness, uh, a refinement of those issues. Uh, and then also um, there, there's going to be a, um, a transcendence you know, of what works, what doesn't work, you have to fed it out. And obviously the personalities change as well. You mm -hmm. know, the, the people conveying the information. I hate to say that the messenger is a message, uh, but too often that's truly the case. Sure. Um, but, you know, if we take in, uh, you know, the fact that we've gone from young men bootstrapping themselves you know, with masculinity mm -hmm. and the, the ideas of what is it to be a man and, and the ideal man and, and to shoot towards that, we also look at now a narrative arc of what it is over multi phases of your life. And mm -hmm. We see that transcending into the patriarch uh, convention, you know, where you have that sort of stuff of men looking to wanting to be fathers that are fathers, what it is about fathering that's so important, and then looking in depth multi generationally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then starting last year, quite honestly, um, you know, if you believe men and women are compatible and complementary and you want to have a conversation about the, the nature of, our, of human conditions, we cannot exclude women from the conversation mm -hmm. because it's such a, a pivotal you know, element of our humanity. And so bringing them in, not just as attendees or speakers, but a convention where they feel safe, it's directed towards them, is segueing, I think, to a greater audience to actually eventually merge together. Mm -hmm. And so I think in what you're seeing now is not only did we have these three conventions, we had them all three simultaneously within proximity of each other. And there was a lot of overlapping, a lot of germination of individuals going from one to another. And in particular, the ladies talking to the guys and seeing 
and what they had to offer and what was the conversations taking place there, mm -hmm. that we would have never had that conversation any other way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something immensely important and human about looking somebody in the eye and holding a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, uh, whether it's about dating, relationships, about life, uh, the intersexual dynamics, finance, business, any of those sort of things being conducted in person with another living human being. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the 22 Convention. This is the second year. Did You, you spoke last yes, year. Yes, I did. Yes. What differences did you observe in the 22 Convention? How are things looking you know, for that innovation now? Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, when we look at these conventions in general uh, within the mastery, anybody can cobble together one convention. Sure. You can get out the door once. Yeah. It's the second one that matters, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. And and so, the first one, in a very real sense, we didn't know who would come, what the conditions were going to be. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of cultural blow up over it, and part of that was the marketing efforts associated with yeah. it. It created a, a tremendous amount of attention all the way around. Uh, that drove attention, but yeah, I think um, it. It's, I guess it's debatable as how effective that was as far as trying to get true conversation going rather than having, you know, the, the big splash of, of attention. Um, and so I think there was a very concern. And, and, and you know, oddly enough, I was the first speaker. Oh, and, wow. so, and so you're, you're one, you're doing this for the first time. And two, you don't know how it's going to be received or what's going to take place. Uh, and surprisingly, it went really well. Um, and so there was dialogue. You were actually able for the first time to talk to women in this arena, you know, arena and have a dialogue. You know, even though we were doing the presentations, we were able to speak at length in between and during. And now I attended more of those talks than any of the other two, specifically because I was really interested in that dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, this time around, we didn't have any of that. You know, you didn't have any of the feminist blowback. You didn't right. have any of that. It was much more relaxed, no anxiety. We had return attendees, which was fantastic to mm. see, which I always like in a normal convention anyway, mm. to see where people were, what's gone, how they've shaped it. And they were very inspired about what not only their experiences last year, but what they were anticipating this year, and then using that to springboard forward for the next year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we saw a lot more of that and have that sort of dialogue. Um, the conversations were continued. Uh, and I, I just found it a terribly rewarding experience just to be a part of that. And you know the attendees that I've spoken to have really enjoyed it as well. What did you talk about at 22 Convention? I, oddly enough, I did not talk about anything with relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about civil resistance, you know, particularly in the age of COVID and medical tyranny. And the issue on that was, I want to talk about culture you know, and how people navigate culture. and. Normally, I talk about relationships because my concern is that I want people to be able to get along but, and to have healthy relationships. But if you don't have the skill set going into it, you don't want to be learning that on the job, you know, at, at a point of conflict or a point right. of deterioration. So you, you really are going into a situation with the skills that you have. Okay. And so when we start with guys with relationships, that was kind of the big one. If we're, we're trying to improve relationships, then you naturally want to improve the, the, your prospects for marriage you know, on family development. So I've always focused in on that. Culture right now is overstepping all that. And mm -hmm. the the nature of the conversations, the nature of the things that are taking place, uh, the tremendous impacts and losses of our civil liberties, uh, freedoms, uh, and just blatant, blatant disregard. Uh, you know, it, 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 we are probably, I hate to say it, in the most unscientific moment in, in our yeah. Imaginable. It's 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 science fiction stuff. I I wouldn't believe the fiction I've always read now. Right. And so <clears throat> there is a natural mm -hmm. tendency to be angered by this, to be frustrated by this, yeah. and the, and the anger is immense. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think in many ways it's a very very natural human reaction to want to push back and to push back hard mm -hmm. and to push back with violence. Right. And if you don't know any other means, that's all you use. So you know, if in for example, if we talk about boundary setting within a relationship. If you don't know how to manage boundaries appropriately in a relationship, you'll manage that relationship inappropriately. Right. And and I see that happening now at a society level scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's not a matter of I'm going to be a drama queen, I'm going to pitch a fit and crash a relationship. No, we have people that are talking about armed rebellion, mm -hmm. taking up arms against the state. Mm -hmm. We have people that have done things and I don't want to project because I don't know, but I mean, you just sit down and say, uh, January 6th, you know, where you have the, the capital insurrection, you know, the insurrection, the, the Instagram insurrection, an individual <clears throat> was killed. Right. 
right? Was there a better way? And I'm not saying well, that they did their, their intent for a clear, just, transparent elections were not justified, but they didn't understand the nature of true civil resistance and how important discipline and behavior needs to be. And so I talked about civil resistance, what's that meant, and why civil resistance is so much more dominating effectively mm -hmm. than violence is. You know, uh, for example, most people don't know that armed resistance, overthrowing a tyrannical government, truly overthrowing the government, only exceeds a quarter of the time, less than a quarter of the time. Mm. But non nonviolent campaigns are typically 45% successful. Mm. So that's a two to one ratio. And, 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 and if you're talking about trying to choose a path, I want to be the, going with the one more successful. Right. Now, not only that, the results of a successful campaign, either violent or nonviolent, are dramatically different. Mm -hmm. The civil societies are dramatically different. When, mm, violence, when violence is interjected into the cultural language and behavioral patterns, it gets repeated. It gets spread. Right. And so one of the quotes I noted was in the last 10 years, all those nations that are going through second, you know, violence and civil strife or using campaigns have typically been birthed 30 years in the past with a violence campaign prior to And so when we look at, you know, so for it's a cycle. Example, it's a cycle. Yeah. And it's a cycle that needs to stop. But how do you stop it when you can't trust the other side not to do violence? Right, for sure. And, and which is a, you know, it's really kind of frightening. And if we look at historically, when you are overturning ideologies, you know, the Russian Revolution, you know, killed 60 million people installing a social system of, of communism and socialism. Right. Okay. The Chinese outdid it with 80 million. You know, in comparison, you know, let, let's put it this it's way. High score they, competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's horrible. I know, I know, it's, I know you don't mean it that way. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about the industrialization of killing. You know, the Civil War itself was only 1.5 million people. Okay, in comparison, oh, only, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, only, yeah, only, yeah, only, it's only. mortifying, mortifying. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I understand what you mean. <clears> but the still, to so the what do World we think? One the, decades later, right? right yeah, you know, right. And so, what do we think the next conflict is going to be? And and by the way, if we're talking with the United States, <clears throat> I don't want to be a part of that. I don't right. want to. I, I. It's not that I don't want to just be a part of that. I don't want to inherit that world. I don't want to put my daughter into the world that will exist after that conflict. Right. Right. You know, or my grandchildren. And that's the idea of looking three generations deep. You know that. Right. That going deep. What type of world are we creating? Mm -hmm. You know, and saying, is this really what I want to see in this world? Mm -hmm. And so my my talk in essence was to teach at least those general facts. And to also then, and then to sit down and showcase as powerful as some of the images you saw. You know, so for example, on January 6th, the administration threw in 26,000 armed troops into the capital area. Was okay. that? Was oh, that, for the inauguration. For, for, for the inauguration and to protect it after, to, to make sure they barricaded. Oh, yeah, the, the National capital. Guard troops yeah, yeah, stationed yeah, right. everywhere. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. And so was that a projection of power? You know, and so one of the questions I asked is, does power flow from the barrel of a gun, as Mao Zedong Tung states? Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or is it really the consent of the governor? And so you kind of go through that. And when you have to throw 26,000 troops into a non-armed insurrection, that really is a selfie kind of, it's a lot of buffoonery, right? right. But the reality is, is in 2003, Georgia did the same thing and did overthrow the government because of very Russian similar things. Russian Georgia. Yes, Russian yeah, Georgia, yeah. yeah. Because of uh, fraudulent elections, non-transparency, you know, and all the things that were in play at that time, you know, and they insisted, and, and they, they ended up winning, you know, they ended up convincing and overthrowing a very tyrannical, you know, an authoritarian, uh, illegitimate government, and were able to do so. So I, the powers that be knew that, right? And so they ended up throwing all these troops in, in place out of fear. Mm -hmm. And they felt they had to show power and seize the power and physically show it. How, how terribly different would have been because remember that evening the capital was cleared out they're back to business had they opened it up doors and had tours walking through the next morning as though nothing happened I know, I know. Just... would we be living in a different world that would have been strength mm -hmm. immense strength and trust in the american people but what you saw was a government afraid of the people mm -hmm. and afraid of loss of power that they had just seized mm -hmm. one way or another and it doesn't spell well when you have a you know every all that background you right. know taking place in the background and it's not just those sort of things and then you look at all the other behavior social with you know the you know i just happen to use COVID as kind of a nice convenient way to ramp kind of the guys up to the point of saying hey look yeah. let's look at more efficient ways right <clears throat> the problem with civil resistance though in many cases is that they look at destabilizing the pillars of the support of the administration 
And to do that well, you have to look at all the major social institutions that support the regime and to sway them one way or another. Now, it's, that's not a passive measure. You're, you're actively, right. it's, a, you're, it's a strategy and techniques of persuasion, of coercion. It's, it's confrontation. You, you are forcing confrontation on it, but nonviolent, all through legal means. You know, and, but that takes decades on average. And we don't have decades. Yeah. But I'm an architect. I can tell you, you can take a building down, not by rattling the cage, the vertical structure, but undermining the foundation. Mm. And that foundation is the mass of people. And we live in a digital age in which we can create content just like this. We have the ability to cross communicate, which is why digital social media censorship is so important. It's why they're doing it. Okay, our ability to communicate, exchange ideas over a broad base area and if you sway people and then the other one is not only convince them okay but to join you and to physically act on it to march to say no to protest to not accept the narrative those sort of things will stabilize or unstabilize a regime and quite honestly we know that the cliche saying is that politics lives downstream of culture mm -hmm. that's true yeah. that's very true Obvious, yeah. okay and politics politicians know that and so why don't we look at forcing that? I think the interesting, another fascinating stat was that no movement has failed when they've been able to mobilize 10% of the population. None, it's 100% successful at 10%. Mm -hmm. And the reality is there were some outliers that skewed it. The, probably the mean for that is about 3.5%, and that's based on uh, researchers' an, an analysis of all these uh, conflicts over 120 years. Wow, okay, so, so nothing has failed at 10%, but you can get the job done at 3%. Uh, 3.5, typically. So, but that's, 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 if, right. that's if you're overthrowing a government that's tyrannical and violent against its own people. Where it's out in the open. Where it's out in the open. Mm -hmm. We don't live in that world right now. Right now. It's, it's moving there. But right now, they're not it depends. Quite. Yeah, I, I, go, I <laughs> yeah. get what you mean. Yeah. And, and so I think the number is actually much lower. And so if the number is lower and the average, the average nonviolent campaign has 1.6% of the population, you're pretty much 45% of the way there. So wait, wait. So, so just to make sure that I understand the numbers, 10%, nothing has ever failed. Average is close. The mean, you said, is closer to 3.5%. That's correct, right. And now, but like really at 1.6%, you can probably make a pretty significant. It's it's not, it's the 1.6% is the average nonviolent campaign population. Average non, okay, average nonviolent is 1.6. <clears throat> high likelihood of success at 3.5. Right. Guaranteeing success at 10%. At 10%. And, and what, it, what you're seeing is, is that even though we're only mobilizing those numbers, there's a much broader support within the population. Right. Okay. Which then sways change. Okay. And it forces people to change the metrics in which they're making the decision. So for example, Southwest Airlines uh, with the pilots unions. Right. You, supposedly there was no strike. They just had a business failure, even though the administration was literally forcing the mandates down and pressuring them to do I that. I heard it was bad weather. I, it, you know, it was, it's just, it's Florida sunshine. It's just too rich sometimes. Yeah, the, the, sun, um, the bad weather that only affects one airline. One it's airline, really strange. fascinating, yeah. Clouds so, chasing them through the sky. Yeah, and, 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 and science. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, it's... It's science. How is that not meteor, science? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, you, you and that would be one institution of power, is unions being able to kind of step together and say no. Yeah. And affect change. And what we're talking about is doing it on a larger scale. And so when you look at just sheer population size, that's why po groups are so important, large. And one of the one of the reasons why I gave the same speech at twenty two convention is that if you exclude sex, okay, as you know, most most women are not wanting to pick up arms on general. Right, right. You're you're losing half your population base. Mm -hmm. And then, by the way, the the demographics that's more inclined for social network mobilization, early discussion, uh, alliance making, supporting, uh, enabling things to actually sustain a movement for tends to be female traits, which is one of the reasons why in a lot of these protests and a lot of these voter registration polls and all you see dominated by the groundwork, the grassroots are always dominated by women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so soft power. They it's so, soft yeah, power. Absolutely right. The and men so, are like calling when I to get off the couch for the yeah, hard power. Yeah, like, right, yeah, yeah, com yeah, completely right. And so when you are t able to talk to women and say, hey, you, it's not just that we need you. We desperately need you now to avoid what's coming, you know, if violence, you know, to prevent that violence, to prevent that alter alternative. Mm -hmm. And we need to act now. And the other is that we need you to engage your partner, okay? And this is where men and women are compatible and complementary mm -hmm. to her, particularly in this realm. 
And so it was really nice to be able to talk to women specifically about that, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to my 21 talk, which was to a bunch of military aged male guys who are naturally wound up, are looking to defend their values and cultures and implement change and can be very easily swayed to join something like January 6th and have that go awry, but this time with violence. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so you say, hey guys, just be very careful what you're doing. You know, there's there's better, more more efficient, more effective ways and to, to create the change that you really truly idealize, not to make change that becomes even more oppressive, more, you know, and by <sighs> intent, you know, uh, that, that gets mismanaged. Mm -hmm. uh, and That's a great I, insight. And so I, I, I sit down and said, you know, and from my personal perspective, if I sat quiet during this time period, I, I, it's not just that I'm missing a moment in time, I would not be able to respect myself going forward, having right. not spoken up to have used the platforms that are available to me to be able to convey that information mm -hmm. to help not only to create a better alternative, but to prevent real human tragedy, you know? And so yeah. we backed that all up. You know, I started out with trying to help individual guys improve their personal lives. Mm -hmm. it, it grew to helping the relationships, marriages, uh, families. And then in this particular case, it's now we're now at a society level. So looking back at the past 15 years or 21, the past 10, 12 years that you've been involved, mm -hmm. are you surprised, like put yourself backwards in time, are you surprised, even setting aside the socio-political climate of right now, surprised that 21 has moved in this direction of family, society, even larger aesthetic and religious values? I, and that's, that's another one that's interesting, is it, it's not just in one vein that that's changing. You yeah. just brought up religious value. I, I think the, the my my favorite panel uh, the, that was recorded the other day on Red Man Group was the religious one. Mm. Uh, you had, what, five five or six individuals up there representing yeah, five, guys. Five, five or six different denominations and viewpoints on religion and faith and, and beliefs in God talk about that in very civil, open, communicating hate, you know, and, and what was also interesting is everybody looked for areas in which they mutually agree first right. and then only highlighted, hey, it's not, this is where you're wrong or this is what we believe. It's just, this, or let me rephrase it, it wasn't where you're wrong, it, this is what we believe, you know, yeah, and yeah. then profit it that way. Consensus building first. It, it, consensus building first, and that's not something you normally see in most manosphere environments or most environments in general when you talk about point. that. That's a good and so, Especially with religion in general. Oh, oh my God, you know, the, the only thing more, <laughs> you know, the, the only other Two topics we could have had that would have been worse other than that was sex and politics, right? Yeah, you know? and 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 we're probably all mostly. Yeah, and at some point we're grabbing all three lines, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know? and that's the Twenty One Convention. Yeah, you know, but you know, to sit down and see that evolution and see that change, I sorely welcome it. You know, I and part of me sits down and says it's so intuitive. You know, it was bound to happen because you you have individuals that are that are truly growing in their interests and everything else that's going to manifest into something bigger. Mm -hmm. But as as ideas share and cross German, it's it's going to take more than just those inroads as well. Or you know, you'll see a lot of growth going in multiple different directions, uh, which I think we desperately need in society. You know, we we've somehow lost that. You know, um, I I. I I love Jack Donovan because of a lot of the symbolisms that he talks about, about men going out making fires and, and that radiating, you know, idea of light. Yeah. And the notion of men sitting around a campfire and people sitting around a campfire telling stories, communicating. Um, and in many cases, you see that in other, other media. So, for example, um, TED Talks were 20 minute talks, right? You mm -hmm. know, just short sound bites, you know, this, you know, mm -hmm. short 20 minutes. There's something to be said about Joe Rogan's five-hour format podcast, yeah. in depth, at length. You know where things are rolling, and it's not just the subject matters; it's the experience of that evening. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. I think we've lost that connection in this fast-paced, moving culture. You know, the journey of the conversation. <laughs> the journey, yeah. absolutely. You know, and how much more enlightening and fulfilling is that? And like, I honestly have a hard time. Um, turning on entertainment media to watch a two-hour video or something, a movie, because what I find is the the reality of a human podcast, a human dialogue, mm. so much more mm. meaningful and non-scripted. And I'm not saying that no, no, great fiction and everything else. You know, I'm tired of the same stories and being redone and everything else. Hollywood's lost that creative edge. Yeah. That we go back to just holding conversations. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, 
you know, that's fascinating. I, uh, You're blowing you know, my mind right now. By the way, well, in the, well, this the whole conversation. The other one was, we, yeah, I was talking to Steve Williams, and in because I don't get to see him often. And it's He's like, great, by the way. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I just love him, and 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 it's one of those things that we're talking. And he goes, you know, Socrates, if I ever won a billion dollars, he goes, you and I, I'm going to set a million aside for you and I to do nothing, nothing more than to sit on my porch and just sit and watch our kids play and talk. And I'm like, it's a good way I to spend a million dollars. I look at that, and you know, I was hard pressed to think of a better way to spend a million dollars. Right. And you just look at it and go, whether you get a million dollars a day, let's let's make that happen. Let's do that anyway. Let's let's make that happen. Yeah, um, and I think there's something just magnificent about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's something I've been reflecting on lately about how what accounts for the explosion of podcasts. Like never before in human history, ever have we had as much access to people just talking. Right. Right. That's all a podcast is. Whether it's a video, or otherwise, it's people just talking. You have you know, live stream conversations like Tony Bruno's channel, you know, and, and many more like that. Just hours and hours and hours produced, every, like billions of hours at this point, who knows, of conversation. And it's cool that, yes, the medium is there to do it, but what accounts for the interest in it? Why are we all listening to people talking versus listening to music, for example? I, and I think you put yep. your finger on it. It's like our creative, our, our visual media, creative institutions, radio, music, movies tv in some sense have failed us our fail have lost their creative yes. edge and so like so what are we as individuals going to do let's create something through conversation yes you know and aj cortez the other day and i'm going to steal this right from him he, he talked about being a dime store philosopher but man that guy can nail some things like sometimes sometimes it's like 15 cents yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> 15 you get a quarter's worth <laughs> yeah but you know he said something he is that the right now people are desperately lonely Oh, it's so true. You know, and so so, so let's true. talk about the medium of a podcast. I think of the police song, you know, where you're talking about a message in a bottle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you you take this, and I don't have somebody to relate to, and, and media is such that it's it's I don't want to say it's garbage because it's poor quality. It's it's That's superficial, okay. it's sugar, it's, it's all those sort of things. Yeah, it's 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 not deep, it's not impactful, and it's only one way, right? Yeah, it's so, very clearly pushing a narrative yeah. at the expense of the actual yeah. storytelling right. and character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so when I do a podcast, I'm doing two things. I'm attempting to be seen and heard, mm -hmm. and I'm putting my message in a bottle and I'm casting it out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then the police song that he talks about waking up in the morning and there's a million bottles washed ashore. Mm -hmm. okay. And I see podcasts and this sort of media very much like that. Yeah. You know, the, the explosion, the proliferation of it is that everybody can put a message in a bottle mm -hmm. and try to find some connection with somebody globally that's out there that's not on my island of sphere of influence mm -hmm. that's out there that we're not in contact. Right. Uh, and then hopefully that message gets to somebody who reads it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's meaningful. And I find that conventions like this takes that and brings those islands of people together. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's just for a couple of days, you end up leaving with a sense of belonging, a connection with other people who are trying and attempt to do similar type things. And you, you're left with a, an experience. You know, you, you live it and breathe it and, and it's a journey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I sat in and I hate to say it, if you're watching this now, it's a video, it's, it's two dimensional. Mm -hmm. This, there's a richness to this That's right. that you, you, you just don't have there. Right. And it's different when the cameras turn off because when the cameras turn off and you go behind the scenes or everything that's going on over there, you can't capture that. Or no, should you? No, right. No, that's right. the stuff yep, where the real magic happens. Yes. Yes. And you know, what I really love about it too is returning and seeing people have returned as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a snapshot right now. Right. It's it's a series, and you're able to say where have you been, what what have what's gone on with you, and mm -hmm. how have you changed, or you know, seeing people progress. And uh, personally, I know I, I focus in on relationships. I'm always amazed at the number of wedding invitations I'm invited to, sure. or pictures of kids. You know, you know, this is my child, or uh, you know, I've I've given two talks where I talk about a dad bag, you know, being a, a mm -hmm. diaper changing. I've heard and, about that. Yeah, no, way, it's yeah. it's. I, and never in my life did I ever think I would be ever talking about that but it wasn't it's not the diaper and the changing that was important yeah. it was caring for my child and developing the pattern of behavior that my child knows when it's under duress to come to me mm -hmm. you know that 
it's that the diaper changing was the symptom, but the result was I wanted the child to see by behavior that I will be there for them. I will hold them, particularly when they can't speak. You know mm -hmm. that that they can only cry or you know act. And I see that in my own daughter and seeing that reflective and just how powerful that that has been. Mm -hmm. You know, and to sit down and say I don't, I can't afford to wait to be involved in her life later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if I if I'm going to have value, I have to distribute. You know. To, to showcase that value in advance, mm -hmm. lead by example, you know, and you, you teach by doing. And part of it was just simply changing the diaper and not just changing the diaper, becoming the best diaper changer in the world. And mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't because I can change the dirty diaper. It's because I cared for the child. I cared for my partner and I actually looked further in depth than the actual act of changing the diaper, you mm -hmm. know, that the, the child's needs. And I took care of all the relationships, which mm -hmm. then made me absolutely indispensable. Mm -hmm. Nobody does a better diaper than I do, mm -hmm. you know, because that they're, they're my unit, they're my family. Mm -hmm. And that's how you care and protect and provide, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Mishler's, you know, that, that the okay. element of preside that I actually yeah. kind of liked as well. Yeah. So. Well, Jack Donovan talks about you know strength, courage, mastery, and other four tactical virtues. And right. as you're as just you're describing, there's something you you wanted to do it masterfully because as a man you bring mastery to your life. You bring strength, strength, courage, mastery, and honor. Why not bring it to changing a diaper? Not for the sake of changing a and diaper, but this is another area that I can express precise. mastery as a man. And I actually used that in part of the talk. Of course. Yeah, you know, and to sit down and and literally, and, and it was actually really funny to see Jack in the room talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and and you just see the, 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 you know, he's making the connections that his work is now being utilized for a kid's diaper and just how wonderful that was, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and, and, but there really is something to that. You know, there, there absolutely is something to that, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, one of the best talks he ever gave was, uh, one of the workshops. Mm -hmm. It was not recorded. And he says, let's talk about just this, but what happens when your business uses this as a model? He talked about business and the four tactical virtues. Yes. Amazing. What if, what if you had a business that said, this is our mission statement? Wow. Crush. We're going to apply this. <laughs> yeah. I, you just kind of go, you know, what would that mean? What would that look like? And it could be any number of yeah. services or products. But what happens if you say, this is how we're going to do this? Mm -hmm. And what a difference that would make in the world. Wow. And you're just, you're struck by that, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think there's a lot of things that, that can be done and leveraged upon whether it's Jack or any of the other number of guys that you can take bits and pieces, cobble them together, and they still work, you mm -hmm. know, and, and come up with something new and original and insightful. Now talk about the 21 Convention Patriarchs event and what you saw going on there compared to years past and, and some of the some of the speakers and some of the men. I, the fascinating one on that was that, you know, the Patriarch event was typically for guys that are fathers wanting to be better fathers, you know, yeah. and, and um, we I, we realized that there was this real dearth of knowledge out there. And so one of the, the projects that we did, literally it started at 21 Convention on the side conversation was, how do you teach guys to father that are under father themselves while they're in the act of fathering. So mm -hmm. you're having to on the job teach guys how to father. And mm -hmm. so we took the notion of a, a, a children's book mm -hmm. uh, and in saying, look, you read to a child to be able to teach language, to spend time with them, to know that you, they, to, to relate with the child, to sit and hold and to engage them rather mm -hmm. than just sort of playing games. And we chose a bullying book to, uh, to develop, help develop a skill set. Like how do you, teach your child not to get bullied. What does that look like? And how to start a conversation well outside of them, you know, like have you seen bullying somewhere else and how bring it forward mm -hmm. closer to them. So the, the notion was always, how do we teach men who are under fathered how to father, right. you know, and who don't know. Um, we're, we're also teaching men who are fathering in the act, be better fathers and men themselves mm -hmm. and to expose them to some of the other ideas. And so that was kind of the premise. And so we, we were doing that. It's, it's evolving and developing and growing. The fascinating element was there were a number of guys at 21, the young men's group, that actually had the opportunity at will to go to the other convention and mm -hmm. sit in on those talks that sat down and said, I would not have paid to come to a fathering event, but because it was available, I could go next door, catch one or two and be exposed to the information, to be exposed to that community of men mm -hmm. before being fully committed. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like trying something on, mm -hmm. you know, taking it out for a test drive or whatever, or even if it's just light exposure. So we're seeing that now mm -hmm. take place as well. Uh, the other is we're also seeing grandfathers show up. 
Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. So, so we always talk about the other. We're seeing grandfathers show Whole up. Whole new convention. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but they're sitting there saying, they are realizing because it's oh, the cool, patriarchy. Right. Yeah, yeah. Is that they, they're now, you know, essentially they're biologically successful, right? Their children have had children of their own. That's Darwinian successful. Wow. And, and they Splash. sit, yeah, yeah. So, but <laughs> here's, here's the difference though. They didn't do it with intent. They just did it, right? Well, yeah. And now they sit down and say, but I missed something along the way. How do I galvanize that legacy? How do I recontribute? How do I start with where I'm at? and make something more of it. How do I strengthen my family tree at this relatively end stage of life? It's not too late. So good. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, because I think I think we have a very youth-centric culture, oh, right? Completely, okay. yeah. And, and we're beginning to change that, I think, uh, particularly with men with the 21 convention and stuff like that, where it's like, no, let's focus on all stages of a man's lifestyle. Like, yes, it's, it's cool to be like young and awesome and fit and the whole thing, but like, Let's think about dating. Let's think about marriage. Let's think about fatherhood. Right. Let's think about this. And now I, I'm, I'm really happy to see grandfathers are coming because there's a real lack of information about that stage of a man's life cycle. Yes. It's like there are so many different aspects of being a man that crystallize in being a grandfather. Like, yes, you can't do the same things that you did when you were like a teenager. You know what I mean? Right. When right. you're the, you know, the Calvin Klein cover model or whatever. Yes. But there's real unique power in a grandfather. I was talking to Ken Curry about this. He was saying in a man's voice and in his presence. The, the gravitas. That's of the, right. Yes. And I believe, I personally believe that a cultivated man in, at the elder stage, the grandfather stage, has more power than like a dozen young men. Well, it's, it's experiential they, wisdom. Yes. Experiential wisdom. And, gravitas, yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is, and, it's, and I'm, and I'm going to, it's, it's not that the grandfathers are now showing up. They were there from the beginning. Right. And some of them are return returnees. They've been to every one. The difference, mm -hmm. no, is they're finding their voice. They're being yes. seen amongst the group now. Yes. And so even within... They're not effect, ashamed of being older. Yeah, yeah. And they're, yeah. and they're not insecure about being there. They're, they're actually more willing to talk to the other guys, to engage the other guys. And in many ways, they're ambassadors of the event itself. Mm -hmm. And you're mm -hmm. seeing that. And so it's it, within a kind of a, a group, you're seeing them kind of take ownership of that kind of group and spirit, not only within their own families, but within the group of men that are showing up. Right. And it's fantastic to see, you know, some of these guys, the older guys show up and to talk, go, you literally go over and talk to some of the younger guys, you know, finding out what their interests are and being, again, mentors to other men mm -hmm. as it should be, you know, and, and, and I hate to say it in part, this is why you come. Yeah. You know, the, the idea is that you're not just looking for information, you're looking for direct experience, people who are role modeling it, yes. you know, and, uh, you know, and we've had fathers, grandfathers speak at, you know, Texas Dom is one of the guys I just love, mm -hmm. you know, at the convention. And he, he said something that I know is so true. It shocked me the moment I heard it, but it's something terribly natural. He's literally said that he's that you'll, and, and this is a man who just loves his children, you know, that there's, it's not a profession of a lack of love. He goes, it's amazing how much you can love your child and how insignificant your child becomes the moment you see and hold your grandchild. I've heard that. Yeah. And he goes, it allows me to make for amends of all the mistakes and fallacies or you know, inadequacies of me as a man and as a father mm -hmm. that I can see past and through that. I'm not the individual. I'm not, I'm not the man in the arena anymore. I'm the guiding hand that can help hold and contour, you know, contain my family unit to assist and alleviate where needed and to influence in positive ways. Mm -hmm. And I find that just a tremendous testament to the man, mm -hmm. uh, to his sense of his self, his obligations to his family. And it's a wonderful, wonderful human sentiment. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to ask a philosophical question here because we're just, we're in it now. I, I struck with this notion that in some ways it feels like society has too low expectations for men. Right in some mm -hmm. ways, like yep. you know, the, like a uh, uh, mediocrity seems to kind of be the norm in many ways, right? right? And, and okay. celebrated, and celebrated. Yeah. But it also feels like there's a flip side to that, where society has too much like over expectations for men. So, for example, any man is naturally going to be imperfect as a man, and therefore will be imperfect in his fathering. Right. And it seems like there's been a generation of kids that came up maybe through the inner work world, where it's like my father did this and my father did this. And yes, there's obviously cases for abuse and neglect and those sort of things. But where you take like, yeah, my dad was a man and he screwed up because he's a man. 
And it's like, you got to be able to see that and let that go. But it seems like there's a lot of holding on to like, my dad should have known, whatever, whatever. Right. This is maybe why I like Jesse Lee Peterson, where he's like, have you forgiven your mother? Have you forgiven right. your father? Right. But I guess in that, it's kind of like, what's that divide between the expectation of mediocrity, setting the bar too low versus setting the bar too high, like you should have been perfect. And maybe the 21 convention is like saying, no, you're, it's okay to be a man and to be imperfect and to always be striving. Right. I, I, I think it's in part, you know, culture lives lives downstream of so many things, right? Or consciousness. In, in consciousness. That's yes. what my friend Arthur yes. Blood and Rain says. Yeah. Like politics is downstream from culture, but culture Conscious, is downstream yeah. from consciousness. consciousness. Right. Love that what he said. That. And, and so let's let's talk about what we're infusing our culture with. Our heroes are not men who who rise above. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. They're men that massively overachieve. But that's not the hero we're really selling. Who we're really selling out in the media, you know, in the public, it's superheroes. And men who are no even, they're oh. not even human anymore. They're, beyond, they're fictional. I mean, there's no attempt. You have to be some, some far off alien brought to Earth oh, with Superman. Man. human. You, you, you don't even, you don't have a chance. The only superhero out of the whole group that's human, that doesn't have some God gift, yeah. is Batman. Yeah, but even, yeah, and I was going to say, or Hawkeye, you yeah, know what right. I mean? Yeah. And, and even then, they're, they're superhuman, right? Yeah, exactly. And he's a billionaire. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. well, for starts. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And then, yeah. then it goes from there, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what is what is some kid sitting... Versus like a Luke Skywalker who's like some some poor <sighs> kid living on a desert planet who discovers his innate potential and manifests it. And, and honestly, how revolting in your presentation, the destruction of that hero. Oh, man. I, I, Once you see that. Yeah, and, and it was one of those things where I saw it and I couldn't give voice to it. Yeah. I just felt physically ill, and I'd, I'd let go of that Terrible. whole thing for forever. And honestly, there was only one Star Wars. There's only one. I the boys in my the house. Empire. I, no, no, actually, Star Wars, Star Wars. And Star even Wars. that was a. If I really honestly were to look at it, it was a disappointment to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know. What they they should have stopped with one. You know, and just oh, wow. yeah, yeah, just I'm, I'm hot not, take. Yeah, 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 just <laughs> just don't don't talk to me about the other six. Pre, yeah. I, I don't care. It's it's only yeah. one done amazingly well. Yeah, um, but you know, to sit down, they had to. They had to destroy your gods. They you had, had to destroy, destroy your models. And Han super, Solo, all of them. Yeah. yeah, and whether it's you know not shooting first or any of that, you know, all that. There's been a conscious effort. Well, his son, like, bzz, you know what I mean? Like that was just, just horrible. And these are our myths. These are you know, this is the things well, that we're the culture the, the myths for. that's trying that is trying Correct. to be right. imposed yes, upon us. Right. Yeah, right. And so what I find is that. If we can culture people with real life people, human conditions, and showcase heroism in the day to day achievable things mm -hmm. and to grow from there, I think we'll have a vastly different culture. But right now, I think fantasy and fiction have become subconsciously embedded into our consciousness mm -hmm. and expectation. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because I think we're here at this in person event where men are seeing each other as men. Right. These are the things that we all share. These are the things that we all go through. We get to see each other's humanity. Like I had friends coming who had, um, you know, from, from my Renaissance of Men Council group who had been uh, enjoying the content, let's say, of so many different creators, yourself included, but like Jack Donovan and right. Alexander Cortez and Tanner Guzzi and Anthony, et cetera, the whole, the whole, and they seem almost, these men seem almost larger than life. Through social media, especially Jack Donovan with the, with the character that he, he creates. He's, I, I introduced him as a live action, you know, uh, literally yes. a live action, you know, superhero. I yes. mean, and he is. He manifests. He, that. he manifests that, and he creates that through social media. It's very intentional. But then my guys were coming here, and they're like, "Okay, who are these guys in person? Once right. you meet right. them, yeah, do they all sit aside completely. behind some velvet robe, right. you know, with their sunglasses right. on indoors? Mm -hmm. Like, don't talk. Yeah, I'll sign autographs. You know yeah, it's mean? like the VIP yeah. section of whatever. Yeah, it is. exactly. But instead, what they found is what the truth is. It's like, no, we're all just men. Yeah, this it is possible to be authentic and to include the larger than life parts of your personality. And then to just kind of put that away and be just the guy you are, right. you know, and to go back and forth and to manifest that greatness within yourself. And you don't stop being great when you put it away, but it's like to show up on social media is different how then you show up in person. And that can all right. be part of being a congruent man. Yes. And I think for men, it, it may be difficult to see that through the, you know, the fourth wall or right. whatever. Right? right. But that's the magic of what goes on here is like, no, we're all three dimensional men and human beings. You well, know? And, and beyond that, it's not just that you see that. 
once or twice or just in passing. Like in other conventions, the, the, the talent shows up, they present, they may have a meet and greet and they're out. Yeah. Right. Right. Here it's four days. And for the most part, all the speakers stay around. They attend the other speeches. They, yeah. You, you, you have, have multiple drinks, social have cigars to, and talk at length, you know, the, and, and honestly, the best times are after 10 o'clock where everyone's sitting around <laughs> the pool talking or carrying on a yeah. conversation. You know, well, you and Jack that one year, I can remember last leaving, year. Li yeah, last year, literally, I, I left you guys late because I knew I needed to get some sleep yeah. and I was speaking in the morning. Yeah. And then as, as I'm heading back to the, the convention, you guys are literally coming up at daybreak, mm -hmm. head, heading back to change and shower. Stayed up talking and, and, yeah. and you absolutely knew you guys were talking like, and you have that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and the number of times I've had guys to sit down and say, yeah, I'm not talking here and I'm, I'm actually bumping into somebody to my left and I turn and here it is. It's AJ Cortez himself yeah. or, or Jack Donovan <laughs> yeah, yeah. or whatever it is. And, uh, one of the guys is like looking at Jack and Jack has to grab the guy and goes, it's me. You know, I, you know and I just, I, you know, I, I can remember the same thing. And I yeah. hate, it's going to sound really weird. I've done this for what, 11 years, you know, and 21 times. And I still, there are new speakers that I know are coming that I'm excited to speak. You know, kind of like, you're kind of a fanboy myself, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I, I want to meet this individual, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's really weird to be able to do that. And I value that experience. And I know that I have that here. Mm -hmm. You abs absolutely have that here. And uh, I, in all honesty, I think we need more than just the 21 convention or 22. I think we need a lot more of this in life, in the world. Yeah. And this sort of idea needs to grow across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I agree. So. I agree. Yeah. I think of like Ian Smith, you know, Ian Smith is almost like a, a, a world leader, not a world leader in like the political sense, but it's like he's Ian Smith. You know? right, right. And there he is hanging out, having dinner, having a drinks. A figure, thing. right. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, he's just like right there next to Jack Donovan. Like, <laughs> is this real life? Yeah, right. And it right. is it, real it, life. It, it is. It yeah. is. It absolutely is. And what I like about it is that Anthony's done a really good job at not only vetting a lot of the speakers, but getting people who are personal and willing to do that. Yeah. And, and the interesting enough is that you know there's something wrong when the person doesn't do that. It's usually a tell. Right. You know, and, and so because you'll, you'll yeah, have people come. I has it really, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, having seen that kind of spectrum, there are some people who have come and gone, you don't see them, and there's, there's yeah, some yeah. conflicts. There's some, and Anthony, you know, at times, will actually have somebody he brings in that he completely disagrees with, but puts them opposite of somebody else to hear two stories. You mm -hmm. know, so uh, it was really interesting that. It's very you know, brave. Yeah, it, it brave, you know, yeah. where you have somebody talking about monogamy and religion and how important family is and bringing in a polygamist. Yeah. Oof. Uh, you, one, two, you know, one, two, and then have them on a panel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, interestingly enough, we have learned though, you don't bring in uh, the fit and cardio folks together. Uh, that that usually is a little more confrontational. Oh, I mean the weightlifting, yeah. and cardio no, the weight, folks. weightlifting, and cardio folks. No, and that's just, that's that, 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 uh, that needs oh, the, to be divided. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that. Uh, but you know, <laughs> we don't need to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was kind of funny hearing some of this stuff. You know, where, yeah, you, yeah. where you're on a panel and it, you know, one video somebody just kind of leans over and looks. You know? <laughs> it's like <laughs> awkward. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. So it's not that everyone's going to agree here, and that's kind of very important. Right. You're going to hear, you're going to have conflicting information at times people mm -hmm. believe very different things uh the religious panel yeah exactly oh, oh my god you know it, it, it eastern talks, orthodox mormon uh, uh uh, Protestant Christian, yeah, Jack's, right, a, right. Jack's a pagan. The first night, I, you know, we're, we're at the pool, you know, it's, uh, the meet and greet, after the meet and greet, the convention hasn't started yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm with Jeff Younger, who's, you know, Orthodox. Uh, I have Michael Foster as a pastor. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting in and we're starting to have a conversation. And they immediately go to religion and it goes deep. I mean, so deep. I, I'm trying to even understand the words they're using that have met. And I, don't know I, I, I just sat there and I go, I'm just going to put my, you know, I f figuratively say, I'm just going to get my foot in the pool. You guys just go on. Do your thing. And for the next 45 minutes, they had one of the most profound conversations back and forth that was amenable, that was sincere, honest, with integrity, with respect. Yep. Uh, and you just sit down and go, my God, the, the chance to just be the fly in that wall. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, two guys that would normally you would think would be vehemently, vehemently opposed to each other. In the in, world, in the it world, would seem that the, would be the case. Right. You know, religion, right. religious conflict is yes. intense. And in and, and what was interesting, they like each other. Yeah. As people. Yeah. You know, and there's something terribly wonderful about that. Mm hmm you know, and so yeah. I'm really glad that we had that that panel to be able to come up. And so that got captured on film, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to 
it, that was an experience I had that not everybody else had because nobody else was around at the moment mm -hmm. that now is shared and be viewed. And I, and I honestly hope that helps bring others in mm -hmm. to sit down and say, hey, we do have these experiences. There, there is room for a growth. It's not just where this thing started. You know, unfortunately, it started with pickup and has yeah, all that baggage those the with front, it. But those are the frontiers at the time. And it really you know, was. You know? It's like, this is, the, this is the new edgy stuff to explore. Let's explore it. But the, the frontier has moved on. But that doesn't mean it wasn't valuable for what it was. Right. And, and, I, and I view it as kind of like, you know, the Wild West frontier. It was this yeah. chaos. And it was a boom town. Yeah. And, you know, and in any of those shows of boom towns, whether it's a railroad show where they have the stops and it's nothing but tents mm. and all all the debauchery and the stupidity and the depravity, <laughs> it, 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 it was. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no doubt it was. But, you know, it's I've always been fascinating about how either fallen societies or boom towns, how they start from that point and then transcend into civilization. Yes. Okay, and which ones do it well and where it falls. And so that's, that's been the, kind of, everybody studies you know the fall. That. Go ahead, sorry, finish the thought. No, Go ahead. And, and so I see that happening with, you know, Pickup and Manosphere and Red Pill and mm -hmm. all that sort of, I see the Boomtown era disappearing and civilizations yes. arriving. The roads are getting paved. Mm -hmm. The stores now have, front, you know, swinging front doors. We now have, you know, we now have restrooms indoors, you know, yeah. running water, yeah. right? Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I see in many ways, civilization entering into this realm. Well, very literally, because we have Arthur Kwan Lee, you know, a, a, a internationally acclaimed fine artist speaking I, incredibly. here. Incredibly. And, and that's the highest level of civilization is the art it produces. It is the expression. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, yeah. and not just an artist, a man who's a philosopher, deeply religious, deeply yeah. committed to family, and expressed into his art. I, yeah. I just like, absolutely awesome. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. You know, uh, as you were saying that, what makes me think what really begins to shift the boomtown into civilization is the arrival of the law, right? The law, well, man, not that's just the, the sheriff, but something beyond you know, that. Yeah, you know? and, and, and we kind of gone through a little bit of that, and that's it's really ugly. You know, so for example, yeah, I... Yeah, well, you get all the bandits on the outside of you town have that, that are used to kind of having their way yeah. with things, and then the law shows up as like the new sheriff in town. New, new yeah. sheriff, and it's it's really ugly, and it's, and yeah. it's, it's messy, and that did come... And that yeah, yeah, yeah. degree of self-regulation and that's that's taking place you right know? and you know um i use the analogy of tombstone which is partial me from being the west and i went to school in arizona the movie the movie yeah, yeah very much movie. so great but movie. but it was based on reality that was all based on reality yeah, and, yeah. and the 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 real life was more fa fabulous than than the, the story the movie they oh, did. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the reality of it was, was much more extreme oh um mm -hmm. yeah and violent and just incredibly violent yeah. um but you know you you have this sort of you know how do you get rid of the grifters and that sort of cleaning up you know the the, the sheer fraudulent behavior in mm -hmm. some of the cases but i think you also need to move on it but civilization the other part and it shows up in tombstone as well as many of the other genres is when the arts start to arrive mm -hmm. and typically it's a traveling theater that shows up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Civilizations on, and that's when the cowboys that are wearing dirty that 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 have just nothing but you know a spittoon and and you know the, your whiskey is either poured in you know a, a clean glass or or you know a, a dirty <laughs> yeah. one you know and then that sort of level of behavior and all of a sudden they're they're dressing they're dusting themselves off to present even minor airs of presentation. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that with Tanner Guzzi arriving to the 21st yeah, yeah, and bringing yeah. a sense of style and everything else and doing it in an unapologetic masculine way. Very much. And so I, I've seen that transformation as well. Mm -hmm. And I see that continuing. Mm -hmm. um, the guys were giving me a bad time because I happen to wear the same shirt that I spoke in because I never left the convention area, right? Sure. And they had come, it's gone back. Shirt, back oh, shirt. Well, I can That's get away favorite from it. of your shirt. It, it is. This is the best so one nice. for the week. But they went and got jackets and, and, and you know, a little, th and they dressed for dinner. Nice. And I'm like, boomtown it, right? You yeah. know, you're, you're just like, there was something immensely respectful. They're, they were representing themselves and they were representing a moment as well. Mm -hmm. This isn't normal. We're, we're going we're gonna to honor this moment by our presence, by how we handle that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well fucking done. You know, yeah. I'm just well done. Yeah. So it's like this is this process of maturation. Well, it also makes me think what about the female speakers, Suzanne Venker and Melissa Isaac coming in and, and speaking here? And these are women with established brands or careers and audiences. Who've come in to compliment everything right. that's already going on? Like right. men and women are complimentary. Yes, and and it's not only do they have something to say, they have something critical to say. So very much, you know. And that was kind of the surprise on the first twenty-two convention was that we had a guest speaker at the very end that was going, that was a woman speak. Yeah, Jennifer Molesky. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and sharp and 
funny and humorous and just in that pure girl next door kind of spirit mm -hmm. and health and beauty. And she radiates and glows that. Just mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, love her. And, and the only thing better than Jen Maleska is her partner and husband. You know, Dale, you know yeah, yeah, Dale. Dale. It's just, I, God, I love that guy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you have that. Then you have... Anthony wanted to increase the more women to talk, and that was critical. Yeah, so it's not just sure. men lecturing to women. The man's playing the you, you, the century, you, you, like a stall back at, yeah. You sell it that way, but then yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, deliver. Exactly. You deliver. Yeah. I, and, and maybe I'm blowing this one too, but we, we're already talking about there needs to be a 22 convention strictly women presenters. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be to, to get women to kind of do it for themselves to have that venue and say hey look it's not that just so it's good. not just men talking to women it's not, here you go that that would actually be the ideal i mean i think it's important because this subject has come up multiple times during the weekend that you know women do well while there is this whole thing about mansplaining or whatever right you know there there is an, an aspect of masculine authority masculine competence where men can in fact speak to men and yes they can speak to women there's a component, I think mansplaining has this implication of being condescending. Like a man speaking to a woman is naturally condescending, right. which I think is, is a pollution, you know, it's a, it's a corruption of an idea because that's not necessarily true. Yes, of course men can be condescending to men. Yes, of course men can be condescending to women. But a man by nature speaking to a woman is not being condescending. And so this has come up multiple times uh, during, during the convention where it's like women do listen to men who project authority. And that's fundamentally, right. and competence, that is fundamentally a good thing. And yet, women speaking to women, as you say about these issues, about femininity, about masculinity, about their true natures, is even more powerful because they get the chance to model it in a way that men don't. And, and that, you're hitting something right on the head. Yeah. And, and the re we know the reality, in many cases, the messenger becomes a message. Yeah, medium is the message, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 right. And I don't care if, you know, the, a lot of the talks that were saying things that we were saying five, six, seven years ago. The facts haven't changed. Yeah. You know? But the difference is, is if you hear it and it takes that speaker to get that point across and for you to absorb it, mm -hmm. that's what we want. So, I, whatever it takes to Whether click. it's me or somebody else or, or whoever it is. We, you just keep trying and changing that messenger's messenger, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if it if finally you pick it up, you know, it's like, it's like, an, it's a book you've read before and you pick it up again, finding all of a sudden a passage mm -hmm. strikes you differently because of the context where you're in. It's been there the whole time you've read it before, but mm -hmm. now this is resonating. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. There's a quote that uh, re, uh, reading is rereading. So the first time you mm -hmm. read a book, you're just catching the overall themes and flow of the thing. But the second time you read the book, that's when you actually read the book. Yeah, you know, I think so too. Very, yeah. very, very yeah. similar. Well, it's in, you bring up the future of the of the twenty one convention. You you have enough um, other than Anthony, right? Who would be the guy on the ground, yes. knowing yes. exactly yeah. the direction, yeah. no yeah. driving the bus. You know, you've you've seen what you said 11, 12 years, something of the trajectory of the thing, along with the trajectory of the men's space and the trajectory of society. Like tie those three together. Oh my, you know, and, and I have a, a profoundly unfair position. Um, you know, because no Anthony, cheating. Yeah, Anthony and I are close physically in proximity, yeah, and yeah. so it's it's not uncommon for him to meet up. We go to dinner. He comes over to the house. We talk, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so we're bouncing we ideas constantly. Intel. Absolutely insider intel, back and forth. But for the twenty one convention and everything else, there, he drives the bus. It, it is his bus yeah, completely. Yeah. I I'm just the the first seat over here. You know, taking the tour and, and yeah, contributing but you got the map okay. and but you know yeah, what I, mean. I, I know I, I know what, technically where we're going on the tour. But man, yeah. he's his own man completely. Yeah. Uh, but I think he's finding his own way, and his 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 life arc is changing. You know, he's now thirty three, right? Yeah, yeah. It's and a big, here, it's here's a big transition point for a man. Yep. And here's a man who's gone through marriage and a bad divorce, incredibly yeah. bad. And I was there for that. Um, and you're seeing as he matures in his arc that he's looking ahead. And it goes back to when he was a 17-year-old punk. He, and I mean that in a very sincere, sincere way, just energy and focus and driving conviction. But he, he knew enough that he wanted to surround himself with mentors. Mm -hmm. I, he wanted these relationships. He had an interest in this. So he found somebody he, he would believe in, you know, whether it's Ayn Rand and Ayn Rand's past. So he found, you know, the Ayn Rand Institute and brought one of their speakers in. You know, he developed those relationships. So he ends up starting with this circle of mentors mm -hmm. himself. And then he 
so damn graciously shares that free to the world, mm -hmm. films yeah, this amazing. stuff, at, at, it always at the best that he could afford at the time and what technology would allow. The scale of technical production at this event mm. is insane. I came last year and I saw it, but I didn't really see it. And right. This year no, no, I no, saw it's, it. It's like we cameras need... and photographers and, <laughs> you know, angles and lighting and video. It's like, it's incredible what's going yes. on here. Yeah. yeah. And, and the it's audio, invisible. the audio, yeah, completely invisible. Yeah. And, and that's... That is the backbone of something. And there's all these other elements that, that he orchestrates as well. For sure. Uh, but, but like that guy. Yeah, yeah that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, what's interesting is seeing that he's open and looking ahead of where his life's going and what's impacting, and he's bringing the folks together. And the yeah. other is he's also very consciously looking at society. Oh, yeah. In a very sincere way. Society is kind of forcing you to look at it like, oh, oh you know. I don't want to. Ah, oh, fine. And, and, you know, you hear him being terribly bombastic about feminism and everything else. And, yeah. And he says it in terribly unelegant ways and just very guttural and yeah, 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 completely. And, and, you know, and part of me goes, oh, damn, you know, the messenger and the message, you know, become sure. linked and everybody can point to that. And, and they're 100% absolutely right. But it's not, it's not out of malice. It's, he, there is a point to it. I wish in some cases there, you know, you, you, you want everything in one body and you're not going to get it. Right. Right. No, no individual is going to embody in everything. But at the same time, he has this knack of bringing others along oh, yeah. to ha other voices. And he promotes that. He pushes that. Mm -hmm. um, and he does it graciously. Uh, I, I see this kind of moving along. And the, the thing that I kind of worry about is that the ideas we're talking about are going to grow and balloon so large that no one individual is going to be able to kind of orchestrate some of this stuff. Is that one organization isn't going to be sufficient. Oh, you know. yeah, from your lips to God's ears. There need to be millions of men yeah, doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In different ways, right, different in expressions different ways. of masculinity. Yeah, and so and the interesting thing is Anthony's never had an issue with any of the speakers going and talking at other conventions, mm -hmm. as long as they weren't competing directly with 21C. And that, sure. that's just a straight be business. Be honorable about it. We don't yeah, need to compete uh, as men. Absolutely. And, and where there have been issues with this, it, it has been a very serious broach of faith, of trust, yes. of relationships. Yes. They were betrayals. And in particularly with when they were absolutely pointedly decided to be so. Yeah. And it's, the decision it's was made. Shameful. Yeah. Absolutely fucking shameful. And and a lot of it's ego. It doesn't based. need to be that way. No, it absolutely does not. And so I I look forward to the day in which we can have not only other conventions, other ideas, and not be competitive in nature, yeah. but supporting and synergy between the groups. How can we work together? How can we share? How can we really, how can we ally and support each other? Yes. How you can know, we and, network? And, how can we coordinate? Uh, yeah. you know, and to grow a tribe beyond 150 relationships. Because that's yeah. that thing, you know, and which we have the capability to do oh, now we the have internet the and yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and and quite honestly, you know, we talk about the messengers. You can have Different messengers saying the exact same things or groups of men. Mm -hmm. But I think their personalities and the leadership styles lend a different cultural influence in hand. Yeah. And we need to find it. It's almost like, you know, a religious experience, you know, shopping for your church, you know, that sort of thing. You know, and I don't mean it just in a religious way. Yeah. You know, it could be a financial issue. It could be a, a, a nutritional right. health. Yeah, exactly. Fitness, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Going, going into the marketplace and finding the thing that suits your needs. Right. Yeah. You know, and in many cases, I think there's almost too many different things going on sometimes in these conventions because you don't have a chance to really dive deep. Into yeah, walking well, I mean, like between conversations in the hallway, conversations by the pool, individuals right. meeting two conventions, you know. Panel. Which was the power of the patriarch convention. Okay. Okay. You know, so it's men about fathering. It's no longer about all these others. Oh, you, sure. You don't yeah, necessarily have all directly and, yeah, yeah, That's for 21C. Got it. But I can see eventually that kind of factoring out where you have a specialty breakout conference for, you know, within the other summits of or a special day or an or afternoon, yeah. you know, right. like this afternoon, we're right. covering this set of topics with this Correct. speaker. So, you yes. know, you, you know, know. Like, OK, so I'm interested in finance and fitness yep. and father. Yeah, okay. yeah. And one of the things I like, too, is the, the notion of the breakout workshops mm -hmm. where you can go deeper. And the thing that I really like about that is that they're not filmed. So yeah, yeah, you yeah. you have a discussion, you have a talk, they get a sense of who you are, um, and now you don't have to stand in front of a microphone and be filmed and ask a question or even try to, you know, God forbid. Be present in front of a crowd. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. and then I'm trying to say something that doesn't look foolish and ask a question or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, then, and more importantly, even at the same like time, yeah. having a discussion, you know, yeah, and so yeah, yeah. Uh, that was really kind of neat, you know, and being able to so kind of gave do, You hosted a workshop, didn't you? I did, yeah. I did, yeah. And it was really interesting. I, I actually was concerned that, the guys, because I intentionally avoid 
the, the notion of violence, right? You know, I bring it up and I talk about the risks and everything else. Yeah, like you My, said earlier in our conversation, like let's avoid that as a societal I, outcome. Yeah, it's a societal outcome. And I didn't want the non-film portion to be, hey, what, what's your recipe for syntax? By the way, guys. You know, if you want these two products together, you know, and, uh, you know, if you place this here, you know, I, and I did not want that. Don't Google portion, that. Yeah, don't yeah, don't no, Google no, that. that <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, but somebody did talk about, it. when do you defend yourself? And, and I even said, there, there is that threshold. There, there is a that moral responsibility. Well, and even the threshold. law acknowledges that. Yeah, correct. And not Religion only, acknowledges our own military that. acknowledges yeah, that. Yeah. But the thing is, it's already baked into the cake, right? As a society. We have these laws and regulations, and the military is constrained by military law. For sure. Okay, with civilian and oversight. some amount of international okay. law as well. Right, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 100%. But when you act independently, yes. you are 100% responsible for that. And man, that is some really thin ice out there. Yeah. Really thin ice. For many reasons. Yes. And the risk. You know, so one of the things I sat down and told the, 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 the patriarch group, have you had to talk about what's your family going to do when they lose you? Oof. And we know your wife is going to remarry, right? We know in the military we talk about Jody, the guy who's sleeping with your wife while you're deployed. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen when you're down? We also know in the military it's not uncommon for guys who serve closely, even like let's say police forces, guys that serve closely together when you lose a partner, that your former partner and your spouse get together out of related sure, trauma. Sure, and it's, a, it's, it's terribly human. You, you can feel skeezy about it. You can sit up and in a very real human issue. This is how... We resolve pain and trauma and all sorts of stuff. Wow. Are you willing to have that conversation? With them? Are you really okay with saying, hey, um, because my willingness to serve my nation and take up arms, I'm going to turn my wife into a single mother and my children are going to have all the effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what you have at risk. This this is what's at stake. If you, if you choose violence, if it's not a conversation you, about men who join the military. Yeah, absolutely. Per se. It's about Abs men, absolutely. men who choose violence as 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 their preferred mean of mean of resist means of resistance. Well, what if that doesn't go well for you? What about your family? You know, what, that's what we're talking about, Correct. as opposed absolutely. to military service members. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But but let's let's go there for a second, and and because it's one of the things I I wanted to talk about, and I didn't. Um, we had service members killed on the Afghanistan withdrawal. One of yeah. the most egregious was a young man who had a newborn that was due to arrive. Yeah. And I look at this as from a men's rights perspective. It was like, did that young man, that young man need to go? No. And the answer is no. Could, no, could somebody have served his disaster. place? Right, right. And, and, I, and do I fault his command? No. But at the oh. same time, I fault the higher command. If that we have a nation that hasn't looked at that and said, you know what, you're deploying into a combat zone, you're in a combat position, you're expecting father. And as an American value, we're pulling you offline so you can see your job. And we're going to send somebody else instead. I'll, okay, yes. I'll add some nuance to that. Not, uh, so the nuance to that would be like, I don't know, um, I haven't served. But I don't know if you can say like, well, we're going to, provide exceptions for service with men who have newborns coming or just born, like within whatever, some, let's say, arbitrarily six-month window. I think, I, I don't know if you can do that, but I know what you can do is you can say the the leaders of the of the high, military hierarchy up all the way up to the commander-in-chief take accountability for the loss of every single human life due to their incompetence. And so, like, you may not be able to say, to prevent the man from being killed, but you can say, my failure of leadership is why this man was killed, right. and I take personal accountability for that, and to feel the grief of that, of the loss of that man and the child that will never know his father, and, and, and to have some co uh, compassion, and and something. I, I will take it one step further. Please. I, I think as a nation, we have an obligation to that mother and to that child to step into their lives and support them. That's right. That's right. You know, very much like how um, Jeff Younger was talking about when you see a service member deploy, who mows their lawn? Who's taking care of this? Who's making sure their kids are getting to 
karate class or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or whatever the case right. may be. And as a society, I think we have an obligation to do more than just, you know, agree to the widow and say, my condolences. Right. Yeah. Men are expected to be superheroes. Those are our myths. Right. But men are also disposable. Like square that for me. Yeah, right. You know what yeah, I mean? Absolutely. Like you have to be the superhuman thing who's able to do all the things and man up. And when we tell you to, but when we don't need you, pfft, whatever. Yeah. Sorry. Well, and the, and the other one is I was struck by the image of the female Marine as well that was killed that, that days before she's literally creating, cradling a child. And this isn't just an enlistment. She's be. an NCO, you know, a non-commissioned officer or an officer in the Marine Corps, skilled, competent, dedicated. And she literally in her social media post just prior to her death says, I love my life. I love what I do. And I look at that and go, that's the greatness of our country, you know, mm. that we have individuals like that, men and women serving in our armed forces doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. And I never knew her in life. Sure. But I think she's that's a memory of her and what she did mm -hmm. through her death. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not lost on mm -hmm. me. And I, I think there's something to be said tremendously about that. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that we have this platform to talk about these issues as men, you and me, 21 report, 21 convention, because these conversations aren't really happening in the same out in the world or aren't happening in the same way framed in the context of masculinity. Try, try to tweet that. <laughs> I and, will. And, and, and in all honesty, yeah. I tried. I, there are a number of times. And it just, it, it, it falls flat. And then, and then you, and I, and, I, and I see this and it bothers me because, and, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm bringing it up now is because I know that this is a platform which others will see. Sure. Is that, I felt impotent in my inability to tongue that, to to speak that truth. Yeah, um, that it just it didn't give that weight, that sense of loss, that sense of value and appreciation. Mm -hmm. And I know there are other men and women out there doing that today. Mm -hmm. You know, that stand ready to do that. They're volunteering. Uh, I, I'm just dumbstruck by that. Mm -hmm. I'm dumbstruck that after all this, we still have people willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got several powerful social media outlets, Instagram you know, uh, Twitter, et cetera. YouTube escalates that, or TikTok is a small form. YouTube escalates that to long form video. Podcast escalates that to long form right, audio. absolutely. But there's still something incredibly powerful about getting together in person to have these discussions, that, you know, by breaking down these digital walls and actually being face to face. Well, and I would say our conversation right now is kind of reflective of some of the things that we would probably have with a drink in our hand. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, completely. You know? <laughs> exactly. And, and I, I just, I, I I, I long for it in my own personal life. I look forward to it. And it's one of the reasons why I just keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, and, and I joke with Anthony. It's like, whether you have me up or not, I just want to attend. You know, yeah, you just exactly. one, one way or the just other. Just to be here. One, one way or the other. Can I, I just want to touch on one, on one more issue. Um, it had come up earlier, and the thought was in my mind, like, we have all these men doing all these different things with masculinity. How do we get them all going in the same direction? And the word that came to mind is harmonize. We don't all have to be singing the same note. In fact, we shouldn't be singing the same note. How do we take everything that we're all singing together with the different themes and how do we bring them together into one chorus for maximum volume? I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's very much like driving. You know, when you're first starting to drive, you, you, you're not looking past the steering wheel. Like it's literally what's two feet in front of the bumper, right? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of men that are focusing on their specific issue and they're looking just at that, just right, yeah, what's yeah, right yeah, in yeah. front of the car. Yeah. And when we start getting more people on the road, we're worried about bumping into each other and there's going to be a degree of that. But I think when we think aspirationally, we're looking way down the road and it's so much easier to drive a car when you're looking way down the road and responding in time with things much further out. Mm -hmm. And so if I think if we're gonna harmonize, we need to think aspirational. What are our real goals? What what does success look like? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a vision and, that. Yeah, it's a vision. And so for right now I would sit down and say the manosphere has very much lacked that. We we yeah. kinda we, we're looking inward what we want, what we want to gain, but we're not looking stage at something. Of the journey. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're not looking at, you know, like when two, between two people, there's a relationship. There's you, there's me, and then there's the relationship. We're not looking at the relationship and where, where does this relationship want to go? Mm -hmm. You know, this, this, this energy. And so and how do we bring other people into other the into, relationship? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we're, we've kind of, in many cases, lost a narrative of where's this kind of arc going and what, what are we truly looking to achieve? And I think if we're going to have a group of men that are concerned about that, that, that kind of needs to be answered. It needs to be identified clearly. And I think that message needs to be created and then, I don't want to say profess, but it needs to be released to the public. Propagated. Yeah, propagated. Yeah, it was a great word. And I think we're missing that component. Um, get that right 
and you're on top of a rocket. You are on top of a rocket. It sounds amazing. It is. It is. I I I hope to take that ride. I hope to either <laughs> whether and, and I say that living in uh, Central Florida, where it, it's almost kind of like watching NASA. Of, mm-hmm. of, I'm not involved in that, mm-hmm. um, but I get to watch it. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's something magical about watching a rocket take flight. You know, all this energy and technology all in a little thing at distance, and all the hopes and ambitions of the thing just sort of launching and going and going and going. And you know, know it's not safe until that final separation, and you know it's hit orbit. Mm-hmm. And there's something about watching that crest over the horizon into the darkness and just saying Godspeed. Thank you, Socrates. Thank you. This is Will Spencer with the Renaissance of Men here with the new 21 Report and Socrates. Thanks for watching. <laughs>